Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Ward Radio live stream. I'm your host, Cardin Ellis. Today, I'm joined in the studio by a superstar cast. I've got live in studio Brittany the Shadow, as well as via the Zoom machine. Got a couple of super smart people here who are going to help us out with a super smart topic. We've got Matt Martinick, not Martinich, Martinick. Uh, self-described nerd on steroids and smartest person in the room wherever he goes, as well as Jonah Barnes, editor-in-chief and ghostwriter for pretty much every single comedic newspaper that's ever offended you on the planet. You can lay at his feet your offense of any satire <laughs> done on the West Coast. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about something super interesting. It's going to be a bunch of, uh, uh, what do we call them, temple predictions? Where are they going to be? Who are they going to be built by? Well, we know who they're going to be built by. But um, the who, the what, the where, the when, and the why. You know what, Jonah, why don't you just tell us really fast what we're talking about today. Give us the rundown. And before we do, though, um, before you give us a rundown, I do have to shout out somebody in the chat that gave a really great comment. Usually, okay, usually the rule is if you want us to read something on air, make sure that you give us a super chat. With that said, like the stream, subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet, share this with your friends, let's get the energy rolling, you know. But um, I got to give a shout out really fast for Jersey G. Where was her comment here? Jersey G, when I asked, anybody have any guesses and why? She said, I hope for mandatory music training for all members. So it's a little off topic, but totally oh, true. I hope for mandatory music training for all members. Music people get stuck in the same callings without end and without opportunity to grow in other capacities. And I got to tell you, oh, man, playing, absolutely. playing the piano nowadays in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I swear it's more of a burden than a blessing. And every time one of our organists dies... There's no one to replace them. Culturally, you can't just let this thing be on autopilot because there's enough piano players everywhere that someone can volunteer. You're starting to get stuck more. And if they don't start getting ahead of this, I see a problem that within a decade to 20 years will be a catastrophic failure unforeseen by our ruling class in the current day. And just like we had the Perpetual Education Fund, I think we need the Perpetual Music Fund in order to train adequate wow. and professional organists and pianists either that or else we got to sell out into the evangel uh, uh, evangelist sphere and start just outfitting all of our chapels with you know um a Stage, mega church a drum kit a pa well, system maybe not a drum kit disco but a ball solid, uh, like pre-recorded music uh, how lame is that dude or start allowing other instruments why can't we strum to the guitar Actually, yeah, you melodica, can. The only thing you can. Banjo? Yeah. Banjo. Yeah, the accordion. The only thing not allowed in church, actually, is uh, percussion instruments. No Ooh. drums. But you can use guitars. You can use an electrical guitar as part of the musical number. I thought you had to get number. it approved. I thought it wasn't. Like... And now, that's just silly boomer speak for I want to uh, control the situation and I quote the manual and I don't really know what it says. Guess I'm <laughs> you know? a boomer. So, oh, um, yeah, that was a little bit harsh. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> dial that one back just a little Ooh. bit. So anyway, um, everybody, come into the chat. If you want us to read uh, something or you, you got something to say, you got an opinion, please send us a super chat. Brittany the Shadow is the keepress of the chats, and she will um, help us stay on schedule and read those. And uh, Jonah, tell us what we're talking about today, brother. First of all, Jersey G, you are spot on. I happen to play the organ, and everywhere I go, it's like... You know, yeah. what's your name again? You play the organ, right? And you're immediately called to play the organ. Jersey G, Jersey G is prophetic. She is prophetic. Yeah. So, yes, we're going to be talking about, so General Conference is coming up this weekend. Whoop, whoop. Everybody's excited? Cinnamon Everybody's excited? rolls. Yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead and put in the chat. Did you just say you cinnamon rolls? Yeah. <laughs> what, why, what cinnamon rolls? Is that like a tradition I was unaware of? Everyone makes cinnamon rolls Sunday morning. Is that a thing? It's in the Bible. Carton. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't realize. Matt, do they Matthew, make cinnamon rolls Matthew, where you're from? Chapter thirty-one. Yeah, right, Matt. Am I right? Are you asking me? Yeah. No, the other yeah, Matt geez, behind you. My house, we usually make cinnamon rolls for general conference. So. Wow. Okay. I'm. Yeah. All, all right. right. I have made it for us before. I, pff, you're just okay. <laughs> you're such a good cook. I couldn't tell one amazing meal <laughs> from another. But wow, okay, I stand corrected. Anyway, keep going, Jonah. So put put in the chat, uh, put in the chat what kind of uh, treats you make for a general conference. Let's see, cinnamon rolls. If it's cinnamon rolls, just put a C in the chat, and we can get a little little poll here going. 
Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that's in the Bible. If you know the, the section of the Doctrine and Covenants that talks about cinnamon rolls, you can also put that in the chat for us. Rock so on. today we're talking about, so conference is coming up and Russell M. Nelson is cray cray when it comes to building temples. So he is going to announce a slew of new temples, probably, probably, maybe. And we have Matt Martinick with us. He is the Nate Silver of LDS Church Growth. He follows all the data. He has his fingers in every pie. He knows what's going on in every corner of the world with the growth, um, whether it be fiery growth or anemic growth. He knows the trends. And he always, every few months, he'll do a fun temple prediction on his blog. By the way, his blog, ldschurchgrowth.blogspot.com. He is keeping Blogspot in business. Um, Matt is still on Blogspot. LDS yeah, Church I was going to say, blogspot. dude, Blogspot. Like, do you also have a pager, Matt? You know what I'm saying? That's... I don't. I don't. I just, I haven't switched over to a different platform. And, you know, I'm, I'm worried it would maybe result in some kind of data issue, whatever. So I've just kept it for that for now. He's all about the. He's all about the data. He's all about the. By facts. the way, dog, you've got the look, man. I'm not calling you a nerd, but I'm kind of calling you a nerd. Like, if I were to call up a statistician and I want to believe him, I want him to have an office just like yours, a shirt and glasses just like yours, a generally affable attitude, and a drink that's completely clear and not dark, so I know that his mind is completely straight. And like, like you, you, you've. I, I just believe you. Just by looking at you, I believe you. I hope guys that look like you made our atom bomb. So, uh, well, actually, they did. You know, uh, the ones working on them now. Anyway. Um, I feel called out. What do you have against non-clear liquids? Oh, uh-oh. Just may Tensions not be. Just, rising. They might fog your brain and, according to Kwaku, harden your pineal gland, which makes you less open to... Uh, well, I don't uh, care. This Pepsi Zero Wild Cherry yeah. <laughs> that I got going on is dang good. Yeah, and I'm totally a hypocrite, yeah. too, so don't worry. Yeah. Anyway. That's Dr. L, not Kwaku L. That's okay. Dr. L. Okay. That's true. That's true. So so hit us. Let's keep going, man. Jonah. All right. So uh, coming up, we're going to have uh, temples, in, perhaps have some temples announced, and Matt has a method by which he predicts where he thinks these temples might be announced. But first, Matt, first, before you get into your predictions, tell us how you got into this. What was it that that got you uh, uh, creating this blog and how it grew and, and what were the, the roots were of your of your of your expertise? Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, sure. No problem. So I've always been really interested in geography ever since I was very young. And um, even when I was like five or six, I'd memorized all the countries of the world based on their, their shapes before I knew how to read. Uh, so I've always really liked geography a lot. Um, and then, you know, until I was, you know, late teens or so is when I started to get into the geography again. And uh, I remember when I was in high school, I, my mom had like an enzyme magazine or something like that on our kitchen table. And I was looking through it and they had a map of where all the temples were in the world at the time. And this was, back when President Hinckley was announcing all these new temples. And so we had a big increase in, in temples, you know, really about twofold increase in a short period of time. And I remember, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, wow, look at all these temples that are in places like Utah. Uh, you know, there was quite a few in Mexico by that point. And then I remember thinking, well, why aren't there temples in other places? Like at the time there was no temple in France, no temple in Italy. And I would have thought, you know, I, I believe there's a fair amount of members there. And so then it kind of led to, well, where are all the members at in the world? And so then I was, you know, doing research and looking into that. And I would buy the uh, church almanacs that used to be in print uh, that were discontinued about 10 years ago. And then um, I found David Stewart's website, more.com. And that was really quite the, the treasure trove of data on church growth, um, you know, and just really uh, great digestible way to look through a lot of it. So that's how I got interested into that. And then, um, you know, when I went on my mission, I, um, you know, still was really interested in, in church growth. I even asked my mission president to get a copy of the church almanac sent to me <laughs> so I could read it, but I was on my mission to get the current stats. On Wait, okay. So hold on. I'm sorry to interrupt your, uh, oh. your, your stirring oration there, Matt, but yeah. um, th the church printed almanacs, like, yes. What what was in it like the weather over the Salt Lake City Temple every day over the city of Enoch? Yeah, the but weather. So within yeah. the almanac is they had tables in there where it showed membership, uh, congregations, stakes, 
Uh, even also some stats that we don't see released anymore, like number of branches outside of stakes, for example. Um, and they're released every year. It used to be every other year. And then about 1999, 2000 is when they started publishing every year. And then in 2013 was the last edition that came out with. Uh, okay, now I, I've heard mention of those stats being published. I didn't realize it was called the Almanac, though. That's kind of interesting. Before we go any farther, just really fast, got a couple of super chats. Thank you, Joshua Williams, for the super chat. Also, um, we got two super chats from Advantage Counseling. It says, I'm on a flight to Brazil right now, flying through a tropical storm. There isn't much else I'd enjoy more than listening to you guys. It's like Church 2.0. You're a staple in my life now. Thank you. Advantage Counseling. Okay, well, first off. Consulting, actually. Oh, a Advantage Consulting, yes. I was corrected by my wife, which happens often. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Advantage Consulting. Thank you for both Super Chats. Um, and I don't know. Dustin. His I name's Dustin. Yeah, Dustin. I don't yeah. know what's crazier. Flying through a tropical storm while listening to us. And performing a financial transaction? <laughs> like, wow, welcome <laughs> to the 21st century. He can do that from a 757 max in the air on the way to Brazil, but we still don't have an official church live stream. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Our, and, our award, and our award libraries are, you know, and, and 1930. Our, and we still have know, a Xerox style. machine. We don't, have an have HD, we don't have an HDMI plug in the... In the uh, in the uh, Relief Society building, I mean room, but we he's 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 sending us super chats from the sky. This mm -hmm. is crazy. Okay, so Matt Martinick, keep going. You were purchasing oh. all of the almanacs and becoming obsessed with with data like Nate Silver yeah. hit it. And actually, actually, we have a quiz for Matt who claims he can recognize every country by its shape. So we have a quiz right here, Matt. Oh. I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but what country is this? Can you name this country? Well, you know I. Colombia. Not to offend you, but I don't know if your drawing's very good. Oh, oh, please, <laughs> Matt. I'm a professional cartographer. Okay, I mean, that's be, Kazakhstan. Maybe, that's Kazakhstan. Uh, All right. Well, that's like Kosovo if it was flattened a bit. But. Okay, so that's O for that's O for one. Second one, Matt. What's this guy? Uh, it looks like Chile. Chile. To me. Okay, he's got one out of two. All right, last one, Matt. What's this? Um. Well. I, I don't think that's a, a real sovereign country. That's Anaheim, California, Matt. Okay, so that's yeah. one for three. <laughs> one for three. But we're still we're still going to give him a chance. So you're super into geography, and you start this blog. For those of the for those mm -hmm. of you that didn't get the joke, that's where Disneyland is. Uh, that yeah, was kind of Anaheim, a, Cal a Californian joke. I think it's on the map. Knows it's where just Disneyland like that. Is. Hey, well, there's a lot of anti-Mormon ex-Mormons in the chat that don't have fun well, or a sense of humor. So, um, you know, we got to we got to explain some things for them. There's also, you know, some some haters that need some explanaciones. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Um, all right. Keep going, Matt. You were purchasing. Yeah, Almanacs. So, uh, so anyway, so when I got back from my mission, I started to, you know, really like start making some lists about like, well, where are, you know, what are the countries with the most members of that temple? You know, and so I started making lists of things like that. And then I thought, you know, I should I should put this online and on a blog. And then that way, you know, other people can look at it. I can get their feedback about things. There can be uh, some discussion there. And then really quickly over time, it ended up becoming a way where I was uh, writing about different developments in terms of church growth development. And um, so that was in 2007 is when I started the blog. And then I started working with David Stewart in 2009, helping him with Kamora.com. And so I still do that today uh, with the very limited time I have to devote to that now. <laughs> um, and so I've, I've maintained the blog since then. And, you know, really early on, that was one of the things I would do is make uh, temple predictions uh, based on, you know, growth trends and other factors that uh, are oftentimes correlated with when new temples are announced. And back then, I mean, one of the reasons why I was interested in that, because it really was a good metric for growth. Uh, in the church back then, most times where you had, a, had to have enough active members in the area to have a temple uh, get announced for that area. Uh, and so that could be, a, you know, a really um, positive indicator in terms of, you know, increase in uh, active membership and self-sufficiency and leadership and so forth. So, uh, but then I started making lists of like, you know, what are the countries with the most members at stake? You know, what are the countries, uh, you know, that have you know, f fastest membership growth rates, congregation growth rates, things like that. So, and it just kind of developed over time to where, you know, I've written, um, you know, book chapters now and, um, you know, academic books as well as. Uh, That's believable. 
and, and Almanac, um, uh, about 10 years ago, David Stewart, it's a 1900 two volume set where we went through the growth of church in each country in the world. And um, I've also been on numerous news uh, media interviews, and I've also presented at some professional conferences, too. So I've, I've been able to get involved in doing this as a bit of a hobby on the side. But in terms Dang. of professionally, I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in neuropsychology and do diagnosis. Whoa! That was my That's favorite I class work. I ever took was neuropsychology. Oh, dude, we got to talk, bro. There's some really cool convos that we could have on. Bro, forget all the statistician stuff. You bored me to death with that intro that should have taken 30 seconds. <laughs> I want to get into the nitty gritty of like, you know, like everything from scrupulosity to like why Jeffrey Dahmer ate people. You know what I'm saying? Like, what? this is like super <laughs> cool, man. It'll have to be a different episode. So. I know. No. Dude. Actually, uh, le legitimately, I, I, I think we're entering an era where so much is required of bishops it would be wise of us to um give some basic entry level training on cognitive behavioral therapy because i think collectively our industrialized food supply is causing some kind of obsessive compulsive behavior in in so many people that it wouldn't be a bad idea if uh bishops were like given uh some more tools that uh modern psychology before it went woke uh gave us throughout the 90s and the early 2000s um so yeah we've got a really Whoa. we've got some really interesting stuff to talk about this live stream just like took a turn and i'm like on a roller coaster ride for it yeah seriously <laughs> yeah. so anyway um matt this is super cool so if i understand you correctly you've uh you were memorizing maps before you were memorizing letters you've always been into the whole correlation uh between um you know, a, a temples and the strength of the church and it also being uh, a, a model that you can use to pre predict where they're going to uh, place temples next. So you kind of almost developed a hobby out of this. And and what are you batting, bro? Are, are you 85 mm. percent accurate, 65, 45, 100? What are you? Yeah, well, and that's something that's really changed over time in terms of, um, you know, what we see for, for temple announcements. And if we were to categorize them into different and, and, you know, different categories of what that looks like, because historically what we'd see with temple announcements is they were usually in places where there was a, a big base of active members to where they would have a medium to large temple announce. So if you think like back to the 80s and 90s, some of those places would be like, um, you know, it'd be like Orlando, Florida, for example, whoop, whoop. like, like uh, you know, Denver, Colorado, that temple was announced early 80s. Eh. You know, in, in the mid '90s, you know, we had temples announced in places like St. Louis, and um, yeah, you know, and so we saw temples that were announced in places where there's usually several stakes, but oftentimes usually about five to ten stakes in the metropolitan area if it was a larger city, and those temple districts typically had about between ten and twenty stakes assigned to them uh, about that time. So, and then in the late '90s, uh, we had that massive increase in temple announcements uh, that was initiated in President Hinckley as president of the church. And we saw a big shift with those temple announcements where we had many temples announced uh, that were small temples. Um, I mean, you think of the classic design back then, it was 10,700 square foot temple uh, that served oftentimes a fairly small uh, number of stakes in an area. And so there was a ton of temples announced for places like Canada and Australia and Mexico. And many of the temple districts only had a couple stakes. Uh, you hmm. know, Stakes. Think of Halifax, Nova Scotia, you know, just a couple stakes assigned to that temple when it was uh, first built. Um, also think of like Saskatchewan, you know, very small, just a couple stakes assigned. Also in Australia, Adelaide, just a few stakes assigned. And so you had a lot of these uh, type of temples that were announced when President Hinckley was president of the church. And, um, you know, but at the same time, you did have some bigger ones that were announced were like, like Pacife, Brazil, for example. That was a temple that had a large number of stakes. Probably like I think it was forty or fifty assigned when it was when it was finally dedicated. So, you know, we had a mix back then, but we had a, a big increase in these smaller temples, and then it went back to being more of okay. Temp the church is announcing temples for larger larger areas, large number of active members, and then about five six years ago, as we saw that switch that switch to go back to announcing temples in areas with few few members generally and, and slower. Okay. Growth so uh, before we go any farther, really fast, keepers of the chats, can you catch us up on super chats? Yes. And then I got some questions for Matt here okay. to address some 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 doubts mm -hmm. that have been expressed about some of these theories. So oh, keepers of the chats, doubting Matt. It. Oh please. Okay, brother Cheerio says I predict an El Paso, Texas temple. It needs one. 
Oh, snap. What do you say about that, Matt? Do you, El Paso, yeah. Texas? Is that, is there yeah, some... that's, that's a strong candidate for a temple. You have three stakes in El Paso. You also have the one in uh, Las Cruces in New Mexico, not too far away. And there's that, I mean, the biggest issue is the border crossing, right? You have a temple across the border in Ciudad Juarez, but that, that is a, a bit of a dangerous trip a lot of times for the members there. And so a temple there makes a lot of sense. It'd be almost like an inverse of what happened with Tijuana, uh, having a temple being announced about 10 years ago uh, because of issues with members going to the temple in, in San Diego. Oh, okay. That's way cool. That's way cool. All right. Next super chat, Brittany. Okay. Joshua Williams. Do you think as they are building temples without Moroni atop and the logo change, they will start removing Moroni from the top of current temples? Never! I, I don't think so. I think in terms we, of you why, shall I not pass! Okay, okay. <laughs> In, in terms of why we're not seeing Moroni statues on the, the new temple designs, I wonder if it might be a cost issue where it's like it's not needed for the temple. It costs so much money. I wonder if that might be an issue. I think a more practical one, though, uh, is in terms of culturally, if we're having temples being built in places where there's not a Christian background in particular, that might seem really strange to have an angel on top of it. And they're like, so do you worship this angel? Like, you know, so I think that might be a factor of it. Well, uh, as well. But I mean, there was a, a move about, you know, I think it was about 10, 20 years ago where there were some temples that did not have the angel nor and I, where they added one later hmm. uh, that were already dedicated previously. So Provo didn't pro Provo used to be just the birthday cake, but then they got, uh, <laughs> then they got Moroni on top. Right. Isn't that right? Yeah. I, I might, might be one of them. I can't remember which, which ones it was where that happened, but, but anyway, I mean, I don't know if it's too significant of a, of, a, of a detail, but it is interesting to see that that's something that's been getting phased out, but I don't think they'll remove them. Okay, uh, so here's something. Here's part some, of the architecture of the building. So, so here's something interesting. When we were rebranding and I was showing some different logos to people, one of the people that I showed it to was a, uh, a brother-in-law who's a stake president who also works in the temple department, uh, pretty high up there, travels the world looking at different temples, so on and so forth. And somebody had suggested when I put out a call for a possible logos for the Ward Radio logo that instead of the A being a radio tower like it is right here in kind of a cool Art Deco uh, kind of way. Uh, With a compass it, in the square in it. Uh, that's what some people have said, and I, I'm not seeing it, but maybe. Oh, sure. Oh, anyway, sure, um, it, it was unintentional, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. So other, But I do have the map with the spectacles from Benjamin Franklin. I will confess that. But wow. um, anyway, uh, the reason why I jokingly, um, well, he said there was there was another version of the logo that had the Angel Moroni in the A for Ward Radio. And, and it did look kind of cool because they made the Angel Moroni look kind of B.A. and modern. But he said, you know, as we're phasing that out, to me, that logo looks dated. And if it's not dated now, it'll look dated in the future because of how we're getting rid of the Angel Moronis. And so. He was he was basically saying it's on the outs. The reason why I said you shall not pass is just because the Los Angeles temple. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Los Angeles temple. Yeah, and can we please can this be in your stats somewhere? Can LA get another temple? Yeah. We <laughs> yeah, need yes, to. You we need to. Uh well, if you look at the Los Angeles temple here, okay, the Los Angeles temple is by far the most beautiful temple in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm opening up the image here in a new tab so everybody can see. Um, but if you look, it, it's very Art Deco style, specifically a type of Art Deco. It was called Mayan Renaissance. Uh, famously, the building that Nicolas Cage owns now that was also the building of uh, the haunted, not the haunted mansion, but like the house on haunted hill with vincent price where they filmed that that was of this same architectural style in the 40s and 50s and if you look all the way on top that angel moroni is a very special and unique angel moroni not only is it massive and they have to take it down to regild it once a decade because so many people take like high-powered rifles and shoot at it and take big chunks out of it and they have to put all the gold back on it really but yeah yeah it's pretty interesting i'm uh I've got a standing order to go up there next time they do it. It's mortifying. They have to build scaffolding to go out onto this temple, and you have to use rock climbing equipment to, like, harness in. So if you fall, the rope stops your fall. It, it, it's, it's absurd, dude. It's absurd. Wow. But this Angel Moroni, look at this, dude. That's a guy at the bottom. This Angel Moroni is a specific type of Moroni that is Mayan. He's the only Mayan oh, Moroni. Oh, yeah. And so if if it now it's Art Deco 1940s Mayan, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So, you know, they tried to make him look uh, kind of Art Deco. He looks very much, if you look like the Oscars, if you look at the statuette of the Oscars, you kind of get a, a very similar vibe to that. But you can't see it on the screen here, unfortunately, Matt. But I've got some really cool images of the original statue getting made by uh, the original artist here. And it's literally the length of 15 men. I mean, it's Holy absurd cow. and it's awesome. And if they took that down, oh, my gosh, I'd be like a tree hugger strapping myself to the, the, <laughs> the, the, the base of the Angel Moroni and saying, bring the bulldozers and the cameras, baby. This ain't going anywhere, man. So anyway, um, Matt, awesome. That's great insight. And I do have one other question for you. You mentioned 10,700 square foot temples. I know they built tiny temples for a while and that was the norm. However, I just looked this up on Google and I'm going to show it to uh, the audience here so they can see it briefly. We also have a lot of super chats to get to. Yes, I will. But I looked up the L.A. Temple and it's 190,000 square feet. The biggest one in the church until Salt Lake City cheated and built that foyer that they actually let the pagans oh. into, so it shouldn't count. But oh, um, cheaters. Yeah. Anyway, uh, are the days of the big temple over with, bro, or are they coming back? No, I, I we still have new temples that are announced that are pretty large in terms of over, I would say, if you want to say it's a large temple, probably over 60,000 or 70,000 square feet. So some of the new temples in Utah are that large, um, like Syracuse, for example, late so I, I don't think that those temples are, are being phased out. And even some of the newer ones are quite large, like in Bangkok. I mean, that temple, I think, is about 44,000 square feet. So that's a pretty big temple for a country with only, let's see here, only four stakes. So, you know, not, not very many stakes, but a pretty big temple. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, Keep, well, so I was going to say, I remember, I remember that change, Matt, that you were talking about. When it used to be... Uh, almost like a, a, a geographical region would earn a temple. I'm making, I'm making quotations with my fingers cause that's a terrible thing to say, but I mean like, like you, you'd have this critical mass of stakes and priesthood holders and temple attenders. And then the church would say, all right, you deserve, you get your own temple. And so when they were announced at conference, it was this, it wasn't just, you're getting a temple. It was this region has made it, you yeah. know? Um, and then that kind of changed with the smaller temples and you're saying that it actually, it it didn't it didn't take away it didn't cannibalize the bigger temples, but it kind of added on smaller temples, and it's been kind of a mix. Right now, you're saying there are there are still some, well, I guess big. I mean, what are the criteria now? Do you think for for new temple construction? I mean, you're using some of these criteria to make your predictions. Okay, right? well, hold that thought. We got to answer some super chats, Matt. Oh, you could okay. be thinking of your answer. What's the new criteria for temples? Let's go to the super chats first. Okay, Stephen Diamond says, obviously, there needs to be a temple at the priesthood restoration site. Oh, boom Maybe shagalaka. Maybe there will be some temple rocks found there. Boom shagalaka. <laughs> Dude, he's, this guy's solid. When I meet this man, I want to shake his hand and yeah. say, you are the epitome of perseverance, baby. So, anyway, keep going. Um, Scuba tea or scubat, however you want to say it, I guess. Okay. Please don't let this super chat take you too far off topic. Too late. Uh -huh. But my second child, both daughters, was born yesterday, and my ambition is potent. What should I know before I start an LDS YouTube channel? Oh, dude. Uh, get used to being hated. I'll tell you that much <laughs> right. right now. I was in political talk radio in a blue state on a red radio station and I've been attacked uh, physically while broadcasting. That one was wild, trying to bust into the studio through the glass. Uh, had a lot of bad comments uh, and a lot of hate uh, talking politics, but man, nothing prepares you for the uh, anti-Mormons of Mormonism. It, it is a special breed of toxic. We'll talk about that later, my friend. Uh, next super chat. Um, okay. And congratulations. Congratulations yes. yeah. on your on your daughter's birth too. That's very exciting. Yeah. Did you name her Carden? It's a girl's <laughs> name too, I heard. There's a chick named Carden. I met her on Facebook. Car yeah. Cardonia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hit it. More super chats. Hit them all. Um okay, hold on. My screen just went black. Sorry. Hold okay. On. Okay, Sharon Parker. I think that many of these temples are being built in prep for the millennium. For instance, mm. the Tacoma, Washington temple was a shocker for me. Oh, Matt's going to have some thoughts on that. We'll come back to him. Let's catch up on the rest of the Super Chats. Uh, Walter Banks, when Gordon B. Hinckley built the Monticello, Monticello temple, he had the angel Moroni be white to mix it up. After the final walkthrough, he changed his mind. 
Oh, wow. have you heard that one, Matt? Can you verify that? Um, I, don't, I haven't. I know the temple in Abidjan Cote d'Ivoire is not gold. That temple, that I think it's got a platinum oh. um, or something like that's platinum plated. Or actually, I don't think it's platinum plated. It's some other metal. But it's, wait, it's what? Like, they gave the so, temple a grill. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> they gave and it, it has to do with uh, some type of climate reason. I remember remember seeing. So wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Abidjan, the Abidjan Ivory Coast. Moroni is platinum. It's. I mean, it's, I don't think it's platinum. Let me just double check and see. What did they, are, are they celebrating the musical artists there? You know, are they manifesting Dude, right. a new album? What is this? I have to put this on the screen. It, it's the the what is this, Matt? The, the yeah, the Abidjan Ivory Coast Temple, but it is not gold plated. It's with another kind of metal. Platinum Moroni. Okay, I'm going to see if I can look this up. Oh, the Abidjan Ivory Coast Temple. And I'm just in wow. searching the the Moroni. I'm seeing pictures here of the I'm temple. Throw it in the Discord. But I can't see a picture of the Moroni. Yeah, if you've got something in the Discord, man. I, I just threw, threw it in the Discord. There it is. Oh, interesting. Cool. Okay, I'm pulling this up so the audience can see. Here we go. This is the Abidjan Ivory Coast temple. A palladium leaf. That's what it is. Palladium. Palladium. I was going to say, ah. how many temples does Moroni need before he goes platinum? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. All right. Keepers of the chats. Keep going. Okay. Danny Gray says, isn't it obvious? No more Moroni statues because the ones we have accomplish a perfect signal design for the aliens. <laughs> yes. Uh, They're I all agree. pointing to the east. We we, we, we we give them ubicación, as we say in Spanish. We give them orientation. Okay. Welcome to welcome to Ward Radio, Matt. Yeah, welcome to Ward Radio. <laughs> very, very tangential, I see. So. <laughs> yes, yes. So anyway, keep going. Okay. Uh, Snagret says, best rumor I heard on my mission is that temples are actually spaceships that will launch during the purging of the earth in the second coming. Wow. Snagret. Dude, come on. <laughs> We don't, we don't, we don't give that away, man. What are That's you doing? why the basements are so big. You need room for the rocket fuel. You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. Come on. All right. Keep going. What's, uh, no, what's we're next? all caught up. Oh, we're all caught up. Yeah. Okay. In regards to the super chat about the Tacoma, Washington temple being a surprise. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And this is, we're circling back to a question that I had, uh, a question that I had about 10 minutes ago that I teased, Matt, and we're going to tie all three interruptions I had of you together here in one question. Um, oftentimes, you see all the anti-Mormons out there, you know, they're spouting their, their hatred guised as concern and so on and so forth. <laughs> and um, I was watching a, a, you know, a, a podcast on Mormon stories where John DeLynn was claiming like, oh, the decline of the Mormon church and they're hiding it by building temples. You know, and trying to rope in some kind of supposed Scientologist scandal at the same time because that's anti Mormon rule number like 21. They're always that's trying right. to co opt other churches' scandals, right? And uh, they're trying to say that, oh, the Mormon church is lying about their growth by building all these temples. And I thought, okay, that's a straw man though, because we don't, I, nowhere does it say that temples are a prize that we give out. That's true. Uh, because uh, an area is well behaved. I could see why maybe in the earlier days of the church, when temples could only built were built by local members who had to fundraise because our church was poorer and uh, members had to pay for the temple. For example, Los Angeles Temple was paid for through myriad fundraising efforts, including a local celebrity swimsuit designer that made the swimsuit for uh, Marilyn Monroe and a couple of her famous pictures and the dress that she was pushing down on top of the big subway tunnel. Um, if my history is accurate, that was the same uh, uh, member who was a designer that was very prominent in the 40s and 50s. The number one swimsuit designer by 1955 was a member of the church and the, the stake that the temple would be in. And she designed a temple swimsuit. You can actually look this up in Relics of the Restoration. 
there's a temple swimsuit she designed and she only made like i don't know like 40 or 50 of them maybe 500 of them it was like some limited edition that had these beautiful red sequins in line sewed on it and everything and she sold it as a fundraiser it's as if chanel were to make some special shoes or special blouses as hmm. a fundraiser for the the american red cross or something and, hmm. and all the proceeds went to it there was a fundraiser that was done uh where we were selling swimsuits for the temple, you know what I'm saying? There's also members who would volunteer their labor and would build or volunteer materials and so on and so forth. So I could see why in the old days, if congregations had to pay for their own temple, then temple construction would only really follow the growth in congregations. But in my lifetime, I I've only noticed a vague correlation with that. It really seems like these cats take seriously the idea that we're in the last days and that everybody should be within spitting distance of a temple, so there's no excuse for you not to go. And the best explanation I've heard is um, supposedly in the 90s, there was somebody uh, in the church office building. Um, I don't have the date on me right now, so I can't attribute a name to it, but I'd love to uh, because I think it's a beautiful saying that he said, we're the reverse of field of dreams. Instead of if you build it, he will come. If you come, we will build it. Meaning hmm. that even if an area doesn't have the money or the funds through tithing sufficient to build the temple, if their attendance numbers are high and they want a temple, the church will just front the cost and will put it out there and say, yes, if you come, we will build it. Hmm. So is that ringing true, Matt? Am I just a podcaster up the creek without a paddle? What's going on? Well, this is going to take me quite a bit of time to go through. So Okay. Um, so first of all, so in terms of the relationship between temple construction and church growth, there's not really much of a relationship. Um, a lot of times we've even had instances where a temple is announced and constructed and growth decreases afterwards. Now, of course, we've had instances. That was a crappy out. temple. Wow. Did it offend a bunch of, <laughs> it was the architecture so bad. Half the people went inactive. There's so, like, oh, well, was... I, I don't know if it is really related to the temple being built. I think it's probably better explained by some other factors going on, but so, so anyway, so we, we have examples of, of where we have temples where, you know, things actually slowed down after the temple was, was, was constructed. <clears throat> Giving a good example, Manaus, Brazil. Um, that was a city, that's a city in Brazil where we had pretty steady growth and congregations and stakes. Temple was, was finished and we've seen really no growth at all since then in units in that city. Mm, okay. Uh, another example would be Panama. So Panama City, Panama Temple, after that temple was built, since then, we've really seen very, very little growth in terms of uh, new units being created and significant increase in active membership. We haven't really seen that in Panama in the last 20 years. Um, but we have also the reverse, too. So we think of like Accra, Ghana, when that temple was built. I mean, there were not that many stakes assigned to that temple when it was completed, and I believe it was 2004. And uh, I mean, today, that temple district is one of the largest in the church in terms of number of, of stakes and districts assigned to it. So, um, so we have reverse and we have others where it, it doesn't seem like it's, it's made a difference, you know, in terms of looking at those metrics for, for stakes and districts, wards and branches. And those aren't perfect indicators. I mean, really to look at church growth, you have to look at everything together because these are just certain indicators, certain metrics that can give us some insight, but by no means as, oh, increase in stakes is the, is the biggest one because each, each has its, its trade-offs with how they might be useful. Um, but in terms of, of the whole idea, if you build them, then they will, they will come kind of thing. So, so the, the church in many areas has been very conservative about announcing new temples. And so to give you a good example, we'll be in the Philippines. So the church only had one temple in the Philippines, in Manila, even when there was half a million members of the church in the Philippines. Wow. A lot of members for Whoa. one temple. Wow. And, and it wasn't just because, uh, you know, concerns with member activity, which at the time was probably about 20% of the members were active then. And with that, um, but there were still about 80 some stakes, about 81 stakes or so when, that, when in the early 2000s. Um, and so that's a lot of stakes for one temple, especially in a country where travel is, is very difficult. You know, you have to really travel by plane or ship to go from, from place to place. And so President Hinckley came to the Philippines in, I think it was 2005, and he met with the members, I'm in 2004, and he met with the members in Cebu City and, and really told the members in the southern Philippines that you need to start paying your tithing to get a temple. And I think the reason why he, he said that, of course, was to say, well, you know, we want to have the members contribute financially for the temple, which is a very important thing for 
the church to be self-sufficient area to have the membership contributing in terms of missionaries and, and donations and so forth. But, but another big reason is that you, you can't have a temple recommend that you're not paying your tithing, you know, and so they wouldn't yeah. really have the, the, the patrons to staff a temple um, in Cebu City. So fast forward now, and now we have, um, I think it's like 11 or 12 temples now in the Philippines. It might be wow. more. I can't remember at the top of my head, but we have a lot of temples now in the Philippines. Um, and we've also seen a, a major improvement in member activity where sacrament meeting attendance increased by 50% just in five years, uh, which is a, a massive increase uh, where that active membership was greatly outpacing, you know, nominal membership growth. So, wow. Um, you know, and so I think that example, the Philippines underscores several things. One is that the church goes through cycles of growth. So if you were to talk about the Philippines 20 years ago, it would be the poster child of saying, wow, look at what bad things can happen if we have poor standards for convert baptism, little accountability with mission presence and missionaries baptizing new members, and really just not really real growth occurring and having so many wards with just very few active members. So Elder Oaks went to the Philippines at that time. There were many stakes that were discontinued, hundreds of wards and branches consolidated 20 years ago. And then we fast forward today and we, we see regular growth. And now we have 126 stakes in the Philippines, whereas uh, 20 years ago there was only 81. Okay, bro, pause, pause. Are you reading off of anything? No. Like, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> like, like, this is so cool. Matt. I want to hang out with you. you. I told you, man. Like, you would need the almanac if you were in Back to the Future and you just had to become friends with Biff. Like, like we don't need to send the almanac back to the future. We just need to get you back there because you'd be like, okay, well, in the 1956, uh, you know, NBA finals, there was a very tight spread of only about six points. So you don't need to vote for the winner. You just need to cover the spread. You know, <laughs> like, it would just be like, I want to gamble with you. Matt, just like we need one day, we need one day in the church where like just the rules do not apply, not quite except for murder. Like I don't want it to be the purge, but it'd be kind of nice if like one day a year the rules about gambling, you know, going to the club, uh, not the law of chastity, babe. You can't run off with anybody else, all right? But you know, I, at the end of the day, it'd be nice just to have kind of like a day off from all the rules. On that day, I want to go to Vegas with you. You know what I'm saying? And I want to do some sports betting. Well, I, I don't know if that'd be very helpful. So. Uh, okay. Well, no, he, can bets, bet on he bets, on, he bets oh! on temple locations. That's dude, what he bets on. dude. Okay. When I did Problem Solver Politics, my assistant Cody said, bro, you can literally bet on anything. And, and they had bets about who would sneeze first in the presidential debates who would get uh, who would get the first to be booed? Like if you go to some of these uh, these betting joints in Vegas, like literally anything like who's going to win the first Oscar? Like there's there's bets for anything and they've created, you know, odds three to one, two to one. And sometimes the Vegas betting odds people on elections are more accurate than like Nate Silver and his guys and the statisticians that are employed by campaigns are. So, dog. I want to know, are there bookies in Vegas that are giving odds on temples? And if there is not, can we open up a fantasy temple league with Matt <laughs> Martin it? You know what I'm saying? Where we just play fantasy temple construction and see where these churches get built. Is that a public service that needs to be done at wardradio.com? So, I mean, maybe tying it back to, to going back to per, temple predictions, right? So we were, we were talking about, like, what factors go into a temple being announced. And so, like, you mentioned Tacoma, right? So Tacoma had been on my list for many years as a likely location to get a temple. And the reason why is because you have a large number of stakes in the south part of the Seattle metropolitan area. You also have, um, in terms of traffic issues, you know, to get to Seattle Temple, that's oftentimes a factor, too, for those large metropolitan areas. And in terms of growth, like that area, there it's been up and down. More recently, we've seen a lot of consolidations in the Seattle area. But five, ten years ago, we did it. We saw a fair number of new units being created, especially in the north part and the south part. So, but but going in terms of what factors play into a temple being announced, I mean, the biggest ones: number of stakes in the area, distance to the nearest temple, how long the the old how old the oldest is in that area that's another factor that predicts where temples are now oh interesting yeah 
So another now, one. Is that a, hold on a second. Is that a stat you added? Or is that a stat that was already part of the zeitgeist of people that are kind of speculating? That's something I noticed uh, when I was, I actually made an algorithm about 15 years ago to try to predict temple announcements. And I had each candidate place have a score that was based you on. You are the <laughs> real deal. You are the real deal. Uh, Nate did, Silver. Dude, yeah. I want to hang out with you. How, who else? Who else? You are super Chad of the freaking number nerds, man. Because who else can just say unironically, well, I made an algorithm once. Just just the <laughs> second you say that, it doesn't matter what it's for. If you have made an algorithm, you are the coolest guy in the room. You are automatically the coolest guy in the room. So, Matt Martinick has proved that like you're you don't have to just do your profession. This is a hobby. Like he just does this for fun. Just he loves the church. He has this hobby on the side and he just does it kind of like kind of like you, Carden. Like it's just this passion project that he does. Like Dude, that kids is so out there, you don't have to get a job and the thing you love to do. Well, you can what's do the hobbies. origin? Okay, before I ask Matt this question, do we have any super chats we got to catch up on? Yes, I'm just okay. looking at that right now. Catch us up on the super chats really fast. And then I want to know the origin story of you recognizing that as a data point in your algorithm. Think about that for a second, Matt. Hit us with the super chats, Brittany. Okay, Carden, you got to help me out here. Carolyn Wright. Oh, Carolyn Wright Gates Music! <laughs> <laughs> that one was really <laughs> bad. I almost died. Okay. <laughs> she says, do you have any information on the modular temples that are being built or put together? We got a video. We're going to play that. Do you think this might be a new way to build to save money? Um, I don't think it's a function of money because I've worked with the temple department before. The, I, I don't think they're hurting for the cash. Because make it a trillion. Yeah. Hashtag make it a trillion. Um, I think what it is is really um, – uh, the ability to, um, I think it's more a function of speed than it is savings of money. I think it's more a function of speed of construction. Also, um, modular construction is very easy to add on or take away from in case you want to expand or diminish the size of a temple. At least it's kind of the, the vibe I've been getting as I've been watching some of these videos where they talk about modular construction. Because, for example, the Los Angeles Temple has a huge problem right now just heating the dumb thing. With the old 1940s and 50s style boiler room with the massive like Soviet tunnels that go underneath just to house the 18 uh, inches, the smallest pipe, like 36 inches, the biggest pipe boiler room steam that ends up going into the radiators that, that, that heats the building that's literally encased with metal and granite, you know, and in those days they built rooms for the traveling apostles and the president of the church in case he needed a place to stay or he wanted to study for a revelatory um, experience and they also had these massive assembly halls for the priesthood uh, the Los Angeles temple you can see pictures of it's beautiful it's it's football fields and football fields and football fields long occupying the entire like third or fourth story of the temple biggest room that I think exists in LA County is at the LA temple it's massive and they don't build those anymore but let me tell you it's air-conditioned <laughs> you know what I'm saying <laughs> and I bet you if once they figured out they're not gonna be using the assembly hall uh, as much because they've now built the Newport Temple and the San Diego Temple and the Bakersfield Temple and the, the Reading Temple and so on and so forth. Um, I bet you they wish that they could kind of diminish the size of that temple to make it a little bit more efficient and functional. Um, and it seems like modular construction allows that while traditional construction doesn't. So I don't know if it has to do with finances as much as um, um, efficacious execution of temple attendance. Next Super Chat. Okay, Danny Gray says, chances of a temple built in Magna, Rose Park, and Centerville, I think it'll happen. Where's Magna? Magna? I think it's Magna. I think you might have just typed it wrong. Magna. Magna. Oh Brittany just, says Magna. It's manga, Magna, as in Magna. Japanese anime. You uh, know? <laughs> anyway, I don't know. What do you think? Magna. What do Where you is think, that, Matt? though? Is that a country? Is that a it's, like, it's like west, west of Salt Lake. Yeah, oh. <laughs> that's in Utah. Salt Lake area. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of additional temples being announced in, in Salt Lake, you know, more kind of the older areas in central Salt Lake, I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, and if there was a temple announced, I would say probably like in the uh, holiday area, maybe, uh, or Sandy, you know, that area between uh, Draper and like the Salt Lake Temple on the, on the uh, east side, that might be an area that's... Hmm. Where all the know, suburban could, moms addicted to Xanax are, yeah. Oh boy! Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, I've never lived in Utah before, so I, I don't know too much about 
you know, I mean, of course, I track where units are being created and, and discontinued and so forth and stakes being opened and closed. But, you know, that, that's an area that it, it's kind of like the one in Taylorsville that's being built that, that fills that area there. I mean, one of the things I understand with temples as well is that in the last 10 years, there's been a major shift in terms of temple attendance in the church, uh, particularly with uh, baptisms for youth and, and people doing their own temple names. And so it's very difficult for a lot of members now to go to the temple to do baptism. So like, for example, for my temple, Denver, Colorado temple, you got to get an appointment a couple of months in advance to be able to do baptism to the baptistry. Otherwise you're not going to get in unless you find a way to get out of, you know, get off work. And, you know, there's a few hours in the middle of the day on a weekday where things are pretty, pretty uh, slow, but you know, and once it's summer, it's not like that, you know? And so it, it's going to be really challenging for, for members to to use the temples often as they want to uh, for that. Now, in terms of like endowment sessions and their stories, that, that's never an issue. I mean, there's, there's almost always space, but um, but I think that's something that's important to note is that depending on what people are wanting to do, and especially the emphasis on having youth being able to do that, and in temple tenants of youth is a very important part of, of building their testimonies and helping them stay active as adults, it makes a lot of sense that you'd build a lot more temples. I mean, some of the new temples in Utah, there's two baptistries, for example. Like wow. Utah temple there's two, two of them? What was that? There's two baptistries? Yeah, in the Syracuse, Utah temple. Dang. Wow. Dude, you are so cool that you know this stuff, dude. This is dude, so knows freaking rad. Okay, um, anyway, last super chat, and then we're going to go back to the question we asked Matt five minutes ago. Okay. Um, Nate Amos says thoughts on the non temple temple in China. Imagine the oh man the imagine the ancestry work that is possible there. That has to be largely be all that happens there. Yeah, when I, I served my mission in South Korea and I did an endowment session once as a missionary and I took a name through that was he was born at like eight hundred BC was how Whoa, old. what? <laughs> so um, you know, so in Asia, you can definitely go very far back with, with genealogy, and there's so few members of the church there. No there's, way. No, there's you like a name? Tibetan monastery where like less than 1% of the scrolls are translated, but they supposedly have 3,000 years worth of a written rec- record. Uh, do you know that monastery that I'm talking about? It's, it's, it's a 30-foot tall wall that extends over a football field. And it's just full of ancient scrolls that have been kept by the monks in this monastery for like just thousands of years. And they've only been able to translate like 1% of them. And, and, and the information, the ancient information that's in there, I'm going to look this up while you're talking. But yeah, like. It, they, I got it. I just put it in the Discord. Oh, dude, this is what I love about this team, man. I'm on it, man. Oh, what's the, it. so what's the name of this? Yeah, this is it right here. The Sakya, what is it? Sakya yeah, Monastery look at this. in Tibet. 84,000 scrolls sealed up in a wall, Whoa. untouched for hundreds of years. The uh, Well, the thing is, it's it was sealed thousands of years ago because, like, they were concerned about it. But some of wow. the scrolls, they say, are, like, literally could be thousands, like, uh, Wait, some, what's written on these scrolls? I, I can't remember all the details. That's why yeah. I was hoping that the genius who literally makes algorithms <laughs> and like apparently dude, knows everything. Dude, he was doing their genealogy. He uh, he just admitted it here. Sorry to the CCP who's listening to this, but we got, <laughs> I mean, Matt snuck over there and was doing baptism for the dead for these people. Yeah, dude, that's cr- that's awesome, bro. Okay, so back to the original question. What because algorithms don't self-create. They can only use existing data and they have to be written and coded by a human that wants it to serve him uh, and calculate on his behalf data. So you came up with the data point. Okay, well, I I want to consider the age of a stake. What was the aha moment that you had where you realized, wow, the age of a stake really is a predetermining factor of whether a temple gets built or not? Was there a specific aha moment or were you just kind of spitballing? No, no. So uh, the way I, I realized that is I, um, in terms of keeping track of, of growth in terms of stakes, congregations, for all the stakes in the church, and which is a very tedious process since there's thousands of them and there's tens of thousands of congregations. 
um, was that I would organize that by temple district. And so I had a notebook back then where I printed off each temple district and I would put the number of wards and branches in each state and I would track that over time to see where growth trends were, were ebbing and flowing. And, uh, and so what I realized, and so after a while I started adding, you know, when new stakes be created, I'd add them on there and stuff. And I'd also put in the dates for when the stakes were created in that temple district, because that gave me an idea of, wow, look at how many stakes in this temple district have been created since the temple was built or before or whatever. And the thing I, I noticed over time is because you have some temples where you're like, that's kind of interesting. They got a temple, you know, 20 years ago. And you look back and you're like, well, they've had a stake there for a hundred years, you know, so that's interesting. And um, even though it's, you know, it is a ways away, but maybe it's not that far away. And so that's, that's a factor that seems to play into temple announcements. Is there a threshold? Is there a threshold? Like, for example, you've seen the movie Moneyball, right? No. Oh, you haven't seen Moneyball, dude. Uh, Matt, you you're Matt, totally you would, you would eat it up. Matt, I haven't seen it either. So okay, oh, Brittany. it's oh, it's it's a statistician's. It basically talks about how baseball went from being uh, an impulsively thought about and considered sport to being a statistically. Uh, considered sport and the the the, the manager and the coach that kind of changed that right but anyway there's a line in baseball it's called like the mendoza line i think it's called where one of the statisticians took all of the 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 teams and all of the players and lined up their batting average and their error average and all of the averages that you can and figured out that okay who is the player in the middle like, wh who is the average player and what is the line that it's worth recruiting somebody? If they've got better than a 300 batting average, lower than a certain error average, and, you know, taller than six foot one, then you might as well hire them because they will be a net positive to your winningness instead of a net negative. Somebody actually did that massive calculation and they gave a name to the line based upon who is considered the first above average player. And it was, I think it was just some guy named like Carlos Mendoza or something. Mendoza. I, I think it's called the Mendoza line or the Mendocino line. Or I remember it started with an M. Anybody in the chat that Mendoza can tell me. Mendoza effect. Uh, yeah. Anybody in the chat that knows what this is, I'm probably botching it. Who knows? Maybe it was Polish and it's the Kaczynski line, right? But I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it was uh, 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 called the Mendoza line. Um, is there a threshold of age of a stake where you've noticed, okay, no stake older than X number of years, say 100 years, has never gotten a temple. Is there a threshold of age where if, if members have been there that long, a temple will be built? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And the thing that makes that hard to answer is, is the geography piece with how close the stakes are together, right? So you're not going to have a temple announced. I mean, with the exception of that whole Ephraim Manti thing, which was really... Uh, un, unexpected with, you know, getting a temple announced so close to that Manti temple when, you know, there's not that many stakes there, but I mean, that, that's a bit of an exception for, for different reasons, but, um, you know, typically there needs to be some distance factor with it too, though. Um, but in terms of what age of the oldest stake, you know, it, it's changed more recently with what we've seen with that number. But one thing that's interesting is that when you see a temple that is, that is announced, it's interesting to look back and say, well, when was the oldest state created? And hmm. usually it is a fair, a fair while, a fair amount of time ago. You know, usually it's decades and decades ago hmm. when that first state was created in a place that's getting a temple. Um, and in more extreme cases, it's like a hundred years or something. You know, like I think in Montpelier, Idaho, I mean, one of those states I think is about that old, if I remember correctly. So. Uh, but the thing that's interesting with some of these more recent temples uh, is that we have had some where the oldest stake is just six or seven years old, like in Vieira, Mozambique, for example, and um, and also in in, um, in Sierra Leone, that stake, the oldest stake there was created, I think, in 2012, if I remember correctly. Um, and so, you know, you, you do see some exceptions to that. It's not just that factor, but it does seem to be a factor that plays into temple announcements is the age of the oldest stake. And there's other ones, too, that we haven't talked about. Another one has to do with how easy it is to, to actually travel. So you have distance, right? But you also have ease of travel. That can include things like visas, traffic, mm. uh, how safe it is to travel from one place to another, too. You know, those are 
things like in Guatemala, that seems to have probably been a factor for the Uwe Tenango Temple to be announced. Uh, is that, you know, it is not that far away from Quetzaltenango, but that is not a safe drive uh, to go between those two cities. Mm. And there's three stakes in Uwe Tenango, so that is really enough to support a small temple fairly well. Um, and so, you know, I think that's something that to, you know, keep in mind. And I think that traffic piece, that's a part that has changed in the last five years where we're seeing that playing a much stronger role in these temple announcements as a factor that seems to be favoring that. And we see that a great example, that would be Mexico City. And we had those several temples announced in Mexico City. Uh, some of those were on my radar and being like, yeah, I'm not surprised, like Pachuca, for example, not surprised at all. That's an area that's seen steady growth, several stakes there, fairly, you know, fairly good amount of distance away from the temple in Mexico City. But you had others that I would like Tula. I had, I had not expected that whatsoever, you know, and so, um, you know, that really seems to be more traffic related or Winchester, Virginia is another one that just totally caught me by surprise because there's only maybe three stakes that will be serviced by that temple. And it's maybe an hour and a half away from the DC temple and good traffic, but in bad traffic, it's not going to be easy to get to. And I think what we're seeing in the, in the last few years is a, is a push for the temple to be within such close proximity to members that they can get there within less than an hour to drive there. So that way they can go, you know, once a month, once a week or whatever, because that's typically been like a Utah thing where, you know, people go every week because it's just down the street. But in places outside of, of Utah and, and Idaho, that's that's not usually the case. You know, we have to travel a lot farther. And with how busy people are and balancing priorities, you know, it's not because the church has all of a sudden grown tremendously because it hasn't. It's really based on making the temple more accessible to members. And um. what with that more than likely is you'll see an increase in some temple attendance as well as a result. Now the trade-off with that though is like I said I mentioned Manaus Brazil earlier in terms of how you know growth seemed to really slow after that temple was built. Now in Manaus one of the things that happened there is that they used to go to the temple in Caracas, Venezuela. That was a huge procedure. It took weeks for them to get there. And so what would happen back then is that they had these temple trips that were very well organized, planned ahead. That required a lot of sacrifice, it required a lot of commitment, it required a lot of time. Well, when you get a temple announced in your area, those things go away a lot of times. And so then we see a decline in attendance because things aren't as well organized and it's up to the members to go on their own. And a lot of times they don't do that at that point. And so I think that's another important factor to consider with this in terms of temple announcements and church growth and how those interrelate because, you know, yeah, you can see increase in temples and sometimes it might even seem like things aren't going as well. And that's because we have less organization and less, you know, time people are setting apart to do that because you, you have to do that or else you can't go, you know? Huh. Okay. Huh. So I got a question. First off, I'm getting savaged in the chat for apparently misquoting the Mendoza line. Apparently it's some <laughs> baseball jargon for a guy that uh, wasn't able to get a 200 batting average in his nine uh, big league appearances. So a uh, I, I'm pretty sure the Mendoza line was more that I'm pretty sure it's not just baseball jargon, but if it's not the Mendoza line, what is the line? There's, there's a baseball term that all of the statisticians talk about, about the line in baseball that's used to determine if you're above or below that line, whether you're a, a worth it or not worth it member of the roster. Somebody in the chat, I know you can all savage me for what the Mendoza line means, but, but you got to tell me what the real thing is. And, and and then we'll go there. Also, people are saying um, there's a couple of good questions in the chat. First off, apparently in the book of Isaiah, it predicts a temple in Egypt in the 18th chapter and 21st verse. Or I, I'm not regurgitating the, the the scripture that well, but somebody said, when will we know about the the temple prophesied in Egypt? And then also, anything about the uh, a temple in Russia, Saint Petersburg temple? I see. There's 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 uh, questions yeah. about in Russia. So, so two things. So Egypt only has two branches in it. So actually three if you count the district branch. One's an Arabic speaking branch, uh, mostly comprised of, of uh, black Africans who speak Arabic that have joined the church there in recent years. It's actually a fairly new branch. And then the other one is the English speaking branch uh, in Cairo. So, I mean, no, no realistic prospects of a temple being announced there. Dude, wait, wait, <laughs> you just knew that off the top of your head? Sure. Dude, you are so cool, dog. Dude, he's Matt Martinick. I'm, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, man. You're better than Nate Silver, man. That's crazy. He's a savant. 
Okay, yes, this isn't, have... isn't even his job. This isn't even his job. Okay, super yeah. chat. But, but going back to your other point you, you asked about was, what was that again? Remind me. It was... Uh, we'll tell you after oh, the yeah, super Russia. chats. It... Yeah, so I don't know. Like, a thing with Russia, I wonder with Russia and China, I mean, this is just my opinion. This might not be accurate, but I wonder if the temple's already there. And it might be more like an endowment house type of situation. What about those apocryphal stories about uh, BYU Jerusalem Center being able to be converted into a temple within 24 hours if that becomes necessary? I, I wonder if those apocryphal stories are true, that it was built to be able to be converted very quickly. Before you answer that, though, Brittany, catch us up on the Super Chats. Hit us. Okay. Jacob Walter says, goatees are the most evil facial hair, by the way. No hate. That's why I stopped growing oh, one. The guy. <laughs> that's, why, that's why Brittany shaved it off. <laughs> I mean, that Come was on, a solid Jonah. one. That was a solid <laughs> one. Man. It made Cardin so sad, but she right? shaved it off. Yeah. I know. Sorry. So next one. Uh, T Brown 3117 says, I would rather have the total membership decline, but have temple activity double. Better to have four quarters than 100 pen pennies. Quality over quantity. Don't at me. Wow. Oh. Well, you're spicy. Hey, I feel, the same, I feel the same about missionary work. It's better to have four killer awesome elders than, you know, eight losers. So, um, yeah. anyway, uh, any other Super Chats, babe? Oh, yeah. Oh, Mitch Palmer says, I also served in South Korea, and I had a name at 100 BC. They go back forever. That's wow. crazy. What about Asian culture, Matt? Uh, besides, obviously, the other Asian religions, uh, you know, they have ancestor respect and worship. And and um, like if you have any friends here, um, my favorite donut shop is owned by a, a lovely not Thai, um, not a Laotian family. Oh, come on. I can't Mom. remember which one they're from. But the, yeah, they've got the, the cool family altar in there and they always put some of the donuts there because you're supposed to leave food out for your ancestors and then they got the little candles and the statues and the pictures of them. It's a lovely little tradition that they do. Um, but I know that there's, there's especially in Shinto also, if I um, remember correctly, in Japan, that um, there's a, a deep respect for uh, ancestry and so on and so forth. So apparently they're just killer awesome in Asia about doing their... Um, doing the work for those that have passed. Uh, and, and conversely, I've heard that like in Australia, um, in, in some Aboriginal cultures, for example, you're not supposed to speak the name of those who have died. The, um, you know, the, 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 the focus on the present moment and the life of the present moment is uh, culturally paramount to um, such a degree that it's, it's difficult to even get the names of great-great-grandfathers, you know, because it's not like they're just, you know, putting the scrolls up that those guys in the monastery we just showed earlier are. I'm probably misquoting these cultures, but the essence of what I'm saying is, is um, I, I think is still true. Uh, what about Asian culture makes it so that you you just have such uh, such incredible names on these cards at the temple that go back so far? Well, I I mean, not not no disservice to the to members there at all, but I, I think a lot of it is it's easy, you know, to be honest. I mean, because the records are all there. Like you go and and see people and a lot of families will have like a bound book that says this is my my family's genealogy and it goes back thousands of years i had met families where they knew when their ancestors immigrated to korea from from china like you know 800 a.d or something or or whatever you know so um i mean though the records are there and they're fairly easy i mean of course i don't think they're really digitized um or indexed i mean so, but I mean, the records are there and of course it takes a little effort, but uh, I mean, that's just a part of the culture, you know, in terms of, of, of that being accessible and those records going back so far. Whereas in Europe, I mean, a lot of countries in Europe, it's, it's difficult to go back before about 1500 or so just because the records aren't there for most, most areas. So okay. It's so frustrating as a genealogist to be searching around in Europe and, and churches are destroyed and records were destroyed. Or if you're doing... American South genealogy. If, any, if there's any genealogists here, okay, like I'm not, I'm not crazy here, but like yeah. in in the southern part of the of uh, the United States, they're all destroyed in the Civil War. These records just get destroyed. They're just destroyed. And oh, there's just nothing. That's frustrating. They're gone forever. All right, other super <laughs> chats, Brittany. Let's keep it moving. And by the okay. way, we have to get over. Uh, we haven't even gotten to the predictions yet. We're gonna have to burn through the predictions and burn through the Cody Wyoming thing. Burn through the modular. We got so much Let's to talk it. about here. Let's do it, Brittany. Super chats, go. Okay, Rex Good says nothing to say. Imagine that. Here's a fiver. Oh, Thanks, Rex. I got five on it. 
Anybody get that reference? No. No, nobody okay, got it. Okay, moving oh, on. Bummer. Okay, Stephen okay. Diamond. Have you seen the Philadelphia Temple? Thoughts? Ooh, I've been inside the Philadelphia Temple. It's beautiful. And when I did the tour of the city of Philadelphia, when we got on the bus, the tour guide sent th- said it was a lovely experience. He said, I'm sorry, but are you guys Mormon? And he pointed straight at us. And he said, you know, just there's something about members of your church when they get on my tour bus, I can always tell they're Mormon. They just have these families and this vibe, and it's a beautiful thing. And he said, I, before I became a tour guide, he said, I taught at the University of Pennsylvania, and I taught construction management. And let me tell you, your temple, he said, it's beautiful, and it's perfect construction. He said, everything is perfect. It's plumbed perfect. It's built perfect. It's like they they literally spared no expense, and they, they left no uh, no detail undone, he says. And it looks like all the, the, the buildings around, he said, I've actually inquired into your building practices. And I was like, what, really? And he said, yeah. He's like, I included as part of my tour because your church always tries to make their temples look like the surrounding buildings. And he says in Philadelphia, there's been many organizations that have wanted to build big buildings here. And he says oftentimes they clash and they're ugly and it's all about what they want and not what's good for the city and this and that. And he says, your church, it's completely different. They come in and you have researchers study the history of the town, study the history of the architecture, and they come up with this beautiful plan of how can they make a temple that coincides with the architecture of the other buildings around it so- while beautifying the area. And he's like gushing about this thing and he's just some dude that used to be a construction management guy that now does tours of the city of brotherly love so after getting complimented by him he dropped me off and i was able to throw a penny on the grave of benjamin franklin so, oh, cool. <laughs> so Brittany, super chats go okay uh snack ordeal says what's your guy's favorite color green oh hurry go around red Nine black and white what's yours matt green Matt, oh my gosh, hi bestie. Yeah, <laughs> you guys can watch Moneyball together. Yeah. It's the green, it's about the green, Moneyball. <gasps> yeah, this is symbolic, bro, this is symbolic. All right, next Super Chat, go. No, Jonah, what's your favorite color? Oh. Well, you guys are going to make fun of me. Is it purple? It's purple. It's pink. No, it's a chick color, look, but you call it's, it salmon. Look, back in the Roman days, it was royalty, okay? And now you all make fun of me because it's purple, but it's purple. <laughs> okay. Right? <no. laughs> I like purple too. So, Don't do you think about bad. the Roman Empire? How often do you think about the Roman Empire, bro? How often do you think about the Roman Empire? More than I'd like to admit. <laughs> what uh, What about you, Matt? Have you seen that TikTok trend? How often do you think about the Roman Empire? No, I I don't use TikTok, so. Oh, you're not missing much, but it is funny. And Brittany <laughs> starts every day with. Uh, with a prayer. With a prayer, also known as a solid doom scroll for at least 20 minutes on TikTok. TikTok. Yep. Okay, next super chat. Go, Brittany. Okay, Advantage Consulting says, whoa, a big word. Uh, Saber Metrics is using stats to assess player performance in baseball going beyond traditional metrics like batting average, considering factors like on-base percentage, slugging percentage, and more from chat GPT. Okay, so Saber Metrics. Was that the word I was looking for instead of the Mendoza line? Uh, I can't remember. Honestly, I have no idea what that super Well, we've got Mormon Saber Metrics here, also known as Matt Martinic. Metrics. Uh, Martin Metrics. Matt the Metric Martinician. Mm. Uh, No, that was horrible. Don't run with that one. But okay, and then the next one, babe, last Um, super chat. No, I think that's it. Oh, that's it? Okay, cool. Okay, so if the chat has any predictions about where those temples are going to be, put them in right now because Matt's going to give us the truth about where these temples are going. North LA, let's go. Yeah, Beverly Hills. We're in the Beverly Hills Third Ward, and I would really like to see a Beverly Hills temple. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Hey, Matt, you got all these (laughs) these people leaning on you, Matt. They're all counting on you. Well, so and the thing is, is that when you have – so many places that might have a temple based on recent announcements. I have 216 potential locations. Are you going to give us a top 10? Do you have a top 10 per chance? I do have a top 10. So that's something I have on my vlog. Okay. Um, Well, let's start out with, are these the graphics that you gave me in the discord, Jonah? Yes. I put them in there, but careful because I put them. Let's see. I think I put them in there 10 down to one. Down to one. So let's start with number 10 and tell us why, bro. And let's 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 power through these, baby. We got a hard out here in 14 minutes. Hard out. You want me to go in reverse order? Yeah, just like a game show, baby. Like now coming in at number 10. Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela is 
uh, the country in the world with the most members is only one temple, and that temple is in Caracas. Uh, Maracaibo has, uh, I think it's about seven stakes, six or seven stakes, that are just in the immediate metropolitan area. And, um, you know, some of those stakes are, are, are fairly old. I think the oldest stake is like 1980 or so, if I remember correctly. Okay. And, um, you know, also could serve some of the surrounding areas. So that seems like a, a strong, strong contender. I wonder, though, with uh, some of the issues with political instability there, uh, if that's one of the reasons why we've seen a delay in that announcement, just because uh, you know things have been very unstable in Venezuela for quite some time. Um, now, Santiago, Dominican Republic, is number nine. So number nine. Dominican Republic um, is, I believe, if I remember correctly, the country with the second most members of only one temple. So Santiago, in the metropolitan area there, there are... Uh, three stakes, but there have been um, several new stakes organized in the last 10 or so years. Uh, really, there's a there probably be about seven or eight stakes assigned to a temple there. Um, and it's fairly far away from the temple in Santo Domingo. So that seems to be, you know, like also like a fairly good contender for a temple announcement given okay. you know, just growth. And there's a fairly good size base of members in, in that part of, of the Dominican Republic. Okay. Um, I don't speak Portuguese, so if I don't say these city names, I apologize to all the Portuguese speakers. But Jao uh, Pessoa, Brazil, is number eight. So that is a, for those who don't know where that city is, it is between Recife and Natal. Natal just had a temple announced recently. Um, I've always considered Jao Pessoa to be a more likely contender for a temple announcement just because there's more stakes in the metropolitan area. There's no no temple in that state of Brazil, and in that metropolitan area, there is something like I think five or six stakes there. One of which is about to divide as well. So you know, fairly good size area. Campino Wait, how Road do you know a stake is about to divide? Like just like like do you got like inside like do you got sometimes, people? Sometimes I do get reports from members um, and leaders around the world. Um, a lot of it's just tracking congregational growth over time, and seeing you know if that stake is increasing number of wards or decreasing. And, uh, and so I track that kind of stuff to see. And so typically we, when we get a stake, especially in Brazil, once we get to about 10 or 11 wards is when it will start to, when it will divide. Um, but sometimes it can be hard to predict because sometimes there's just eight wards and then they'll divide the stake to create multiple new wards when they do that. So sometimes it can be kind of hard to tell or they'll take several stakes to create a new one. So, but again, but going back to that, that's why I would say John I feel is. so emasculatingly uninformed. Dude, I just, told you, man. Just I told you, around man. with you. Like, dog, do you have trouble making friends? Because the second you have conversations <laughs> about anything, everybody feels like a total rube and just an idiot. So, like, I don't want to hang out with that guy unless I've got my Encyclopedia Britannica next to me. Like, why? I just... well, I, when I'm with my friends, I don't usually talk about this kind of stuff. So, but anyway. Okay. Um, unless they're interested in it, but yeah. so I'll go back to the list. Uh, so number seven is Viña del Mar, Chile. So this is the metropolitan area in Latin America with the most stakes about a temple announced. Mm. So, uh, if I remember correctly, there's something like 11, 12 stakes in that area. It's on the coast, on the, on the Pacific Ocean coast of west of Santiago is where the city is located. Uh, it is an area where we've had massive consolidations of stakes and, and wards about 20 years ago. However, in the last you know 10 years or so, we, we really haven't seen any consolidations for the most part. We've actually had a district become a stake in that area um, in the last five or so years, if I remember correctly. Um, and so just because the stakes are getting older, and also in Chile, we're seeing a lot of the wards increasing in active membership in the last five years, especially, uh, you know, which has been a very exciting development because Chile has been really one of the, the most um, sad stories in terms of church growth in Latin America, where we had uh, over 40 stakes discontinued 20 years ago. Well, that was um, also because of corruption. I remember that had to do with uh, a big corruption case where Elder Holland had to come down and had to put that, the kibosh. That might have been the case. That's not my understanding, though. Um, I mean, a lot of it was that they were creating wards that had like 20 or 30 members. Now, and they were very rushed uh, with baptism preparation. And these well, and there was a period where socially it was it was cool to be Mormon in Chile, which is actually kind of wild. But there was there was a time of wild growth. I, I, 
be surprised if it was like in the 80s and 90s if that might have been the case. But yeah, no, I had so. members in Argentina that served in Chile. Yes, during the 80s and 90s, and they said it was really weird. But like part of the reason why we have some strict, such strict questions now in South America is he said because there was actually a period of time in my mission where it was considered like almost trendy like i guess like i don't know scientology wow. was in the late 90s or something you know where it just is somehow it got trendy and he's like and a lot of people would get baptized almost like uh they were joining the ymca in the 70s because the village people sang about it you know like i i don't remember all the details but i do remember this uh, this elder not this elder but this guy in my ward in argentina who was a carpenter who had served in in chile had actually mentioned that so um I, I Chile is kind of a wild place. I have my 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 biological father served there, my uh, half brother served there, my sister served there. I mean, it's it's a beautiful and awesome place. And before we move on to the next uh, number six temple, I gotta say, I would go to that temple dedication on that beach. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, I mean, it is for purely spiritual reasons. I'm getting a religious <laughs> visa to go surfing. I mean, go serving. I said serving, serving, serving. in the temple Got in it. Viña del Mar, Chile. Because, yeah, that looks like an epic vacation. Um, the Los Angeles Temple, it's kind of funny, but there's actually a giant church-owned apartment complex behind it where for like eight bucks a night you can stay there. And it's meant for temple patrons. So if you need mm. to – it used to be that you had to come from very far distances. So the church provided this awesome like 100 room. It's basically like a free hotel where you just like pay for the turning of the bed sheets or something. But I remember it kind of pissed the temple president off because he's like, yeah, people come here and then they serve for a day. They rent rooms for three days and I see them bailing out of the, the temple parking lot with their surfboards. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I remember we had a family member of the temple presidency and he lamented the fact that we're like subsidizing surf vacations for people that come from other states to go surfing. I mean, serving Look, if in the L.A. temple. Look, it closer to God, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's where I stand. So anyway, keep going, my man. Are we on to number six or you still got something to say so, about so seven? Number six. Is, is again, I don't speak Portuguese, but I think it's a style to say Brazil. Okay. So, this is a city that is in southern Brazil. <clears throat> it's a part of the Florianopolis um, metropolitan area. So, this would be the first stake in, or first temple in Santa Catarina state in Brazil. That's an area we've actually seen some fairly strong growth recently. We've had several new stakes created in the last five years, and uh, which is interesting because recently we've actually been having some of probably the most rapid growth ever for the church in Southern Brazil. Some of the missions have been baptizing over 200 converts a month uh, in, in just recent months uh, from reports I've gotten. So uh, so that seems like a likely candidate just because, again, there's a fair number of, of stakes in the area that are fairly far away from Curitiba, Brazil, and Porto Alegre. Uh, and also we've seen steady growth in that area too. Okay, number five, hit it, bro. Number five is uh, Kampala, Uganda. So Uganda is the country of the world right now that has the most members without a temple. Mm. So there are three stakes in Uganda, two in Kampala and one in Jinja, which is a city that is just a little bit, um, a little bit east of Kampala. So I think that's a likely candidate just because it does have the distinction of being the most members without a temple. Um, over 20,000 members are in Uganda. Uganda is one of the, so Africa typically has fairly high member activity rates. Uganda does not though. Uganda has some of the lowest activity rates among countries with the most members in, in Africa. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why that announcement hasn't happened yet. But I think it's likely uh, just based on distance as well as um, steady growth in Uganda. But again, Uganda grows some of the slow, some of the slowest growth we see in Africa is actually Uganda. So. Uh, any idea why? I believe that's yeah, where that's Luke Hansen question. served. You know, um, I mean, Uganda didn't get a mission until I think it was 2005. It used to be part of the Kenya Nairobi mission. And a lot of times when we have a mission that services other countries, those outlying countries, they don't get a lot of times the attention um, and the resources needed to properly, effectively um, do missionary work in those countries. Classic example of that is, is in Ethiopia, which used to be part of the mission in Uganda, actually. And until the mission was created just to a few years ago um, in Addis Ababa. But so I think that's been a part of it is it just hasn't received much resources with the creation of the Africa central area a few years ago. That's really. Wait, wait, wait. So, so you just, okay. So somebody just named the city and you just said, Oh, it used to be part of this mission, but then it was part of that. And you just have this all on the top of your head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Pop quiz. No pop quiz, bro. Pop quiz. What mission is, what mission is 
uh, Lexington, Kentucky in? Well, I mean, I imagine it's probably in the Kentucky Louisville mission, but there's only, I think, only one mission in Kentucky. I'm not as or frankly, Kentucky. No, it's the United States in the last ten years. So. Oh man. Okay. What about I don't know. Um, Saint Petersburg. What well, that's mission? part of the Russia Saint Petersburg mission. So. Oh, it's its own mission. I'm trying to stump you here, Madagascar. Dude, he's got you, man. The island he's of Madagascar. What mission is that in, dog? What? The island of Madagascar. What? What? What mission oh, is that in? Its own mission. The Madagascar Antenna Arriba mission was created. I think it was in 1999, 2000. Okay, I give up, dude. This is freaking insane. This is awesome. You got you, man. Okay, so Uganda was number five. You've got number four now. Interesting. This is yeah. So number four is Carver Springs, Colorado. That's where I live. Um, so I think that's a likely candidate. We have five stakes here, um, all of which are fairly good sized in terms of number of congregation, and um, you know we make up a disproportionate number of temple patrons for the Denver, Colorado temple, and our oldest stake uh, was created here in 1960. So we have, I think, a lot of things going for us to get a temple here in Colorado Springs based on those factors. Also, a temple here would service um, Pueblo, uh, which has a stake, and also the San Luis Valley probably would also come here, too, instead of going to Albuquerque, where it goes now. And then also Garden City, Kansas. Part of that stake, or maybe the whole thing would come over here, but maybe part of it would go to Topeka when that temple is done. So, okay. Um, it, last, uh, I think we got another super chat, right? Keepers of the Chats. I do believe uh, I think it was a Diamond Dave or Stephen, Stephen Diamond. Diamond. Stephen he says, Diamond. "As much as I yeah. want another temple in Pennsylvania, I think it will take a few more years before another one. But I believe Taiwan or the Philippines get one." We also had some predictions from members in the chat: Antarctica, the Hollow Earth Temple from Snagret. Did totally very perspicacious prediction right there. Yes, we had Vatican City. Vatican City is up there. I think that's a very likely candidate. We also had um, speculation about the mobile aircraft carrier temple, a mobile oh, island temple, oh. which would service the uh, snowbirds, right? People who are living in Hawaii or they're down, they're in San Diego, and then they're going up to Seattle or whatever. You just ha you just float a little temple up there to service Dude, them. Dude, I got an employee so, that's literally... That actually was, a, if, I understand, if I remember correctly, that actually was an idea that, that, that was... You know, floated, no pun intended, about what? No, what? Uh, there being a, like a like a cruise ship temple. I think it was President Kimball was some, was a prophet that suggested that as possible. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. They were unironically talking about having a cruise ship temple? Well, like, it would be like a boat temple. But, yeah, I, I think so. I think I remember hearing that once. I'm not sure if it's true or not, though. What? what? That is That's so wild. cool. Wait. No, no, on this channel, all apocryphal stories are true stories. Okay, wait, no, but, okay, I got an employee that's studying to be a bush plane pilot in Alaska. He's always wanted to be a bush plane pilot in Alaska. Apparently, that's, like, a legitimate profession that makes decent money. He says it's super fun, and he loves Alaska. But, like, how cool would that be if your job was, like, bush plane piloting temple patrons <laughs> to the flotilla, the flotilla, the USS Moroni? <laughs> no, this is brilliant because think to of all land these on the aircraft carrier uh, uh, temple. We could buy <laughs> just like the Coast Guard gets all of the decommissioned Navy uh, vessels for uh, some of their um, less dangerous anti-drug running operations off of like San Diego. Like we could purchase the old World War II decommissioned aircraft carriers, land our Mormon bush planes convert it into a temple and then have the funny people we would just have to paint the whole thing white instead of gunpowder gray yeah think of all these retirees in saint george you know it's like you're going on cruises all the time anyways do a temple cruise temple yeah. cruise <laughs> brilliant only if it brilliant. comes with the free ice cream still yeah and as long as the water doesn't taste like diesel fuel all of my yeah. buddies that have lived on aircraft carriers say whenever that thing's full steam ahead they're like there's something that's wrong with like like the venting or something he's like oh geez. he's like i could always tell whenever we were at like more than 20 knots or whatever because he's like the drinking water would start tasting like diesel fuel so anyway um Okay, uh, keep going. Hey, somebody in the chat Four? said no. Philippines, they're going to love number three. Hit it, number three. Uh, yeah, so Angeles City or Olongapo, Philippines. Um, so the Philippines has been really pretty well saturated now with temple announcements. There aren't very many more places left that seem like likely candidates. I mean, maybe like five or so I could see as, as remote possibilities to strong possibilities. 
Um, so this is one of the last ones that seemed like a fairly strong possibility just based on stakes in the area. Olongo Po is a pretty interesting area in the Philippines because about 10 years ago, there was no stakes in the Philippines Olongo Po mission. It was like seven or eight districts. And maybe actually there was one stake that might have been in the Angeles mission. But anyway, and then in the last 10 years, all of those districts have become stakes. So it went from having like one stake or no stakes to like eight stakes from all the districts becoming stakes. That goes back to what I mentioned earlier uh, in this episode about how we've seen this big improvement in member activity rates in the Philippines in the last uh, 10 years. Um, and that's been one of the things we've seen is that these districts have finally been able to meet the criteria to become stakes. And they have to meet the criteria, oftentimes it's for six months to a year study before they can actually apply to become a stake to make sure it wasn't just like they're trying really hard to meet criteria and then it they can become a stake and it falls apart and then they have to discontinue it. Um, so that's the reason why I have that on there. I do think that's a very strong um, candidate uh, for a small to medium sized temple. And then I have for number two, Spanish Fork, Utah. Ooh. So one of the things that always surprises oh me is when I talk to people and they're just shocked that Utah can get any more temples. That's and what I'm saying. my response to that is, of course they're going to get more temples. There's, so, there's over 2 million members of the church in Utah. Even if we were to use an estimate of 40% of member activity, which would be you know probably a little bit conservative, might be more like 45% are active in terms of you know going to church at least once a month is what I'm using for that, that, um, you know, measurement for that statistic. Uh, and that, that's a lot of people. And if you think of the number of, I mean, there's, there's almost 30 temples now in Utah, most of which are, are large temples. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, a lot of issues that the church is having with temples is that, yeah, I mean, you can get into endowment session pretty easily, but some things like baptism is, is not easy to get into. And so that might be a reason why we're seeing more temple announcements is to really have that be accessible. You know, it's so fun. Oh, yeah, Brittany. I don't feel bad about wanting a North L.A. temple anymore because sometimes on the freeway, it could take us, what, two hours? Uh, it's bad. And you Maybe have to take, more. Yeah. You might have to dip down to Wilshire and take Surface Street. Yeah. So yeah. if Utah gets another temple, I don't feel bad about petitioning for a North L.A. temple. And you know what's hilarious about your picture that you have here of your prediction of the um, Spanish Fork Utah temple is so they have all those. I wouldn't call them ugly, but I would call them very overstated windmills at the base of that canyon. What's funny is the city of Spanish Fork doesn't even get that electricity. It gets all piped to California in order to reach our quotas for alternative energy. Mm -hmm. So from what I understand, mm -hmm. it gets all That's piped true. to California. And I love how a temple there would probably serve California just like the wind windmills do more than it serves the local population just because we got so many people moving to Spanish Fork, driving <laughs> up all of your costs of everything. We're like, yeah, sorry, we already communized our country. So we're going to come in uh, settling. We're going to colonize yours. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> By the way, uh, build us a temple now. Build us a temple so uh, we got somewhere to go. You know, um, that's hilarious. So Spanish Fork, Utah is number two. Now, do we need some sort of drum roll for the number one? Yes. Well, and, and one thing I'd finish in terms of Spanish Fork, it's not like, you know, this is just building a temple for the sake of building a temple. I mean, it would serve 20 to 25 stakes if there was a temple in Spanish Fork. So there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot. And it's also a very rapid growth area in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Mapleton and um, you know and surrounding areas and so forth. But anyway, uh, honestly, if we so ever moved to Utah, that's where I would want to move. So yeah, like fine. Hobble Creek and Mapleton yeah. is all literally a bunch of mid-level entertainment industry professionals who are probably paycheck to paycheck here that sold their house here for two million dollars, and they walk into Mapleton and they're like, "Oh, I can get like ten acres for this." You know okay, fine. Like, wow, Spanish okay. Four can get a temple. Fine, Spanish fine, Four fine. can get a temple. All right. Okay, <laughs> cool. So um, do we need the drum roll now? Do we need the yeah. drum roll? Okay, hit it. Drum roll, drum roll. Uh, we got our Nate Silver genius. All right, Matt so, uh, number one, I would say, is Olam Batar, Mongolia. Hey. Mongolia? Yararai! Mongolia? Did not see that Yararai coming. Yararai, Batar. What were you even saying, dog? Is that like a real thing? I serve my mission in Ulan Ude in Buryatia. Yeah. I serve my mission like right the next city up from Ulan Batar. No, but isn't Mongolia its own country? Yeah, it's. I serve right across the border from Mongolia in Siberia, Russia. 
Oh. So do they speak Mongolian in Siberia too? So the well? people there, the people there are, they look like they're from Mongolia. They're like a tribe called the Buryats, the Buryatians. And they're, they're, I mean, the work there is marvelous. They accept the gospel. Right. Well. Some of the strongest branches of the church in Russia have been in, in that, like, uh, like Ulan Uze, for example, that's a, that is a very strong branch that is primarily comprised of members. Matt like, knows his stuff. Matt dude. Knows his stuff. Okay. So Ulan Batar. Mongolia. Okay, what's your reasoning behind this one, Doc? Well, I mean, distance-wise, it is extremely remote, thousands and thousands of miles away from the nearest temple. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two stakes in Ulaanbaatar, um, and we also have, um, I think it's just one district now, because the other district was discontinued in, um, in Urdinet. Anyway, uh, but yeah, so there's two stakes in the district, very remote. Uh, Mongolia has um, over 10,000 members of the church used to be a very rapid growth area for the church. At one point, Mongolia had the highest percentage of members who have served a mission. Served a mission. That's right. That's that's right. And, uh, really? but nowadays, you know, that is not, I mean, things have been fairly stagnant for the growth of the church in Mongolia. There hasn't been any wards or branches created in some time. One of the challenges that the church has had in the last 10 years is that religious freedom continues to be getting more and more restricted. Uh, in the 90s, things were very open. Um, I mean, as a matter of fact, the Mongolian government actually invited the church to come to help set up their higher education system um, in terms of uh, couples from BYU were, were part of that process and helping them transition into a uh, more of a capitalist system and, and so forth. Uh, but that warmth towards the church in Mongolia, I think, has really um, not, has not been sustained. Um, and in, in more recent years, there's, I think, a, a big threat they feel towards their culture with outside groups. And so we see a lot more restrictions with that to where, you know, only Mongolians were serving in Mongolia. And that might be still the case today. Uh, yeah. But there's still a core of, of uh, strong members there, that number and, you know, the thousands in terms of active members. So it seems like a, a logical uh, choice for a temple, uh, for a small temple in, in Ulaanbaatar. Uh, but it might face similar challenges like we see with the temple in, and, uh, you know, in Russia or in China um, in terms of, of government approval and stuff like that. So that might be might be an issue where it's a temple that's announced and takes decades to be built, which we've seen with other temples uh, like Kiev, Ukraine was like that. Yeah. Temple in, in Colombia was like that as well, too. So. Hopefully they don't have uh, the Cody, Wyoming City Council in Ulaanbaatar. Yeah, well, speaking of which, move us on to the last. Move us on to the last subject. By the way, guys, if you haven't had a chance yet, please make sure you like this stream. We only got ninety nine likes. We haven't even crossed a hundred yet. This is just really embarrassing. My mother's watching. Guys, and, Carden, uh, no. you're gonna you're gonna break his heart, guys. Come on, give him some likes. Yeah, so Look please make sure you like it. Also, if you got any last burning questions, if you have any other opinions or anything like that, please send us a super chat. We're gonna read that super chat on air if we can, and it's appropriate. And it's germane. Then uh, we'll do that. Uh, we yeah. have. The Human Encyclopedia of the LDS Church here for you guys. If you have for any you. questions for Matt Martinick, he literally knows everything about the everything. church. He everything. literally knows everything. He know. Can you name all the prophets in order, Matt? I cannot. Uh, he doesn't know everything, <laughs> but he knows. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> he knows the last time you went to the temple. Yeah. 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 He knows the last time you were there, guys. Well, the more you know, the more you realize you don't. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So anyway, uh, catch us up. What's this Cody, Wyoming? Uh, I, I hear they'd be getting flack over there. Uh, who wants to lead this off? Matt, Jonah, who's 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 taking the reins on this one? I'll give a little I'll give a little intro and Matt can reel me in. So the church announced a temple in Cody, Wyoming. Um, and it, around around the early uh, late spring or early summer of this year, it went. The design has to go before the city council for approval. Um, the church owned the property. Everything was kind of going to plan, um, and the city council approved the design. Um, but then, uh, whether it was actually neighbors or it was just anti-Mormon groups, started complaining about it, and the city council wanted to go back and kind of uh, renege the approval. And the church said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you approve us, we buy permits. We, we buy materials, like the, the, the ball starts rolling. You can't just like turn it off like a light switch. And so they uh, threatened a lawsuit. And so now you get this 
narr- this Hollywoodian narrative that this big Mormon church, this big LDS church corporation is coming in and stomping on the poor people of Cody, Wyoming, you know, and threatening a lawsuit with a big army of lawyers when the church is just saying, you know, this this is how it's supposed to work, guys. And you can't let me guess. That was the Salt Lake Tribune. Like that was the Salt Lake Tribune. And, uh, uh, undoubtedly. And a it's special a couple broadcast of, of the Mormon stories. Podcasts. Yeah. Mormon ish. Yeah, yeah. And these different anti Mormon podcasts that okay. are just oh, so oh, so objective and um, factual. <laughs> Yeah, and they wanted to, they wanted to make that narrative so badly that the church was coming in and, and stomping on people. The uh-huh. church wants to work. The church doesn't want to make people mad. The church wants to like, honor your and, community and, why, and build a temple. This is why I always say, if you can't trust what they have to say in 2023, how could you trust what they have to say happened in 1823? Because no joke, as I literally in this live stream, I talk about a guy who taught construction. At the univer at Penn State or University of Pennsylvania, whatever their university is there in Philadelphia, who pegs me on a tour in the city of brotherly love as being with a Mormon family and then gushes about how respectful and great the temple department is as a non member who is just a professor of like. Uh, he, or he assisted at the university in uh, construction consultation. I have to go back and find this guy and find out what his exact title was. But in this live stream, I tell the story about how respectful and kind and beautiful and loved by professionals in the construction community of, of Pennsylvania. Um, the, the, the temple department is, you know, and then and then I have to go and hear the antithesis of that is happening in Cody, Wyoming. And it's just not believable for anybody that has real life experience with the church. It's like. It's just not believable. These people are vultures that prey upon the naivety and ignorance of the outside onlooker because with firsthand experience, I can tell you that that is not what happened. And, so, and just to and just to make it clear to, to people who chapter one of, of real estate, guys, is that the United States has always made a provision for churches to construct buildings close to their members. So you have zoning laws and it's like commercial and industrial and residential. Anybody who's played SimCity 3000, am I right? Am I right? Yeah. SimCity fans in the chat, right? <laughs> I haven't played okay, so, it, but I know it. Okay, so, <laughs> okay. but, but we've always made exceptions for building churches because it has to serve the members who are nearby and you don't want to build the church way on the outskirts and have people have to drive an hour to get there. So it's always been an exception. So you have people online saying, well, the church is breaking zoning laws by putting this, this worship building in the middle of a residential area. You know, guys, you don't understand the basics, guys. Like, that's that's never been never been out of line. But Matt, reel me in, Matt, reel me in, okay? Be go soft, go soft on me, Matt. Okay. How to do? So, so just a little bit about the church in Cody. So there are four wards in Cody. Cody has a population of about ten thousand people. The average ward in Wyoming has four hundred members in it. And so, if we were to make an estimate on how many members of the church there are that live in Cody. It's going to be about 16% Latter-day Saints. So that's a pretty high percentage. That's actually higher than wow. the average for Wyoming. And, Holy cow. Uh, you know, and, and the Cody Wyoming stake has been on my list of stakes likely to divide for a number of years. It has 13 wards in it. Um, there are, I think, around the top of my head, there's five wards in a city that's just to the, uh, the northeast. And there's a few other wards. Wait, nearby. the Cody so Wyoming stake. stake has 13 wards? It does. That poor stake president. Wow. I know. Once you get over 10, you really feel bad for the stake president. Wow. Like what uh, What does he, how, what? Now, what's crazy is Cody, Wyoming is where the university is, correct? I've had family that's yep. lived in yeah, Cody, Wyoming. Yeah, there's a Wyoming. student ward there. Mm-hmm. Jeez, Louise. Yeah. Actually, I think the student ward, what is the name of that other city that's to the north? Uh, uh, northeast I, there, but anyway. Well, also yeah. that's where not P Diddy. Uh, Kanye West built his shoe factory. Did oh he yes, Kanye it? West shoe factory. That's right. That's right. And that's I, why it rings a bell, Matt. That's why you know it. Okay. Because the Yeezy <laughs> shoes come from there, right? I'm no, yeah. I'm pretty oh, sure it's, it's Powell. That's the name of it. So Powell, Wyoming. Is... Oh no, okay, Powell. Yeah, I had family that lived in Powell, and they called it life between the two water tank because apparently there's a water tank as you exit the city and a water tank as you go into the city, and there's like oh, yeah. one stoplight in the middle. So Powell is where the, the the student ward is. Yeah, hit it. Um, before you go anywhere, keep us in the chats. Hit us up with the super chat, please. Okay. Um, Minor Prophet Ian Malcolm says, "Has Matt heard if there has been any movement on the Kirtland Temple by the church or the temple lot?" Ooh. Um, I I have not. I don't. I mean, that's kind of like a whole different realm of interest that I don't really follow in terms of, you know, some of those 
those really historically significant properties the church had that doesn't anymore. So I, I don't know, but I, I'm pretty certain the new temple that was announced for Cleveland is not going to be the uh, Kirtland, uh, Kirtland Temple. It's going to be in a different location. So. Guys, this is easy. The solution is easy. You heard it here at Ward Radio. We need one stake in the church to all in mass convert to the Church of Christ Temple lot. Just one stake. That's all it would take. Yeah. <laughs> then we are a majority of that church, and we can vote to give the lot back to the LDS church. And we can get rebaptized. Bada bing, bada boom. Bada Here, bing, radio, you bada heard the Got to flirt to convert. You know, <laughs> got to convert to flirt. Or no, got to convert, convert. I don't know. I totally oh messed that God. one up. That was horrible. We can was do that, it, guys. We can do it. Yeah. The movement starts here. That's funny. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, okay. So catching us up on Cody. Yeah. So what did yeah, I get so wrong? And, and also some of that growth has been recent. So two wards were created at stake in 2015. Uh, one in Cody and one in Powell. So used to have 11 stake or 11 wards before then. There's two other um, stakes that are nearby. So it would be a pretty small temple district. Only three uh, stakes would likely be assigned to it, especially because we have a temple that's under construction in Casper. So Riverton, I imagine, would probably go to that temple. Um, so I'd probably just serve those three stakes there. But it is fairly remote. I mean, it's several hours to get to the nearest temple, uh, which is in Billings. So that is a ways away. Uh, so this was a temple that was not on my list of predicted temple um, you know, locations. I, I never even considered it. So I was mm. totally surprised when it was announced as a temple, um, as, as, a, as a temple being um, being built there, because like I said, there's only three stakes there. It's, I mean, it is a ways away from Billings. It is a ways away from Casper, but it's not like that far away. I would think Rapid City, South Dakota would be a better candidate because it's just more remote, but that would only be for like two stakes. But anyway, um, so, I mean, it, it does make sense in terms of, okay, small temple. I mean, Gila Valley, Arizona is kind of like that. And that was announced, you know, 15 years ago. That was announced a long time ago. And does and, this happen yeah. often, Matt, where you get this kind of pushback, right? Because it's happened, uh, where was the place I was thinking of? Oh, in Boston, in Belmont. The Belmont Temple uh, had pushback. This, the steeple was too high and the community kind of got mad. Well, it even and, happened in Utah. They had that with the temple in Tuella. Um, and they ended up making some changes with that as well. Huh. So this is not the first time that no, it people happens, come out angry. It's pretty common. I would say if I were to make an estimate of how often there is for this community opposition, maybe a third of the time um, to maybe half the time, there's a fair amount of opposition for a temple. And does it, ever, does it ever prevail? Does the church ever say, all right, fine, and they fold up shop and leave town? Uh, well, um, that has happened before. So White Plains, New York is a great example of that, where the church eventually just, just gave up because um, the opposition to me was so intense to building that. Wow, temple. really? When, when was well, that? Well, the Newport, the Newport Temple took over a decade of red tape to get through. It had, been, it had been announced literally like a decade before they broke ground, but they finally persevered and won it was a small group of people that was really going up against it but apparently had big funds newport beach is a really wealthy area so um yeah but in white plains new york you said they finally just just packed up their bags and left they did and um, and what happened with that is they just right around when the church scrapped plans to that temple when they announced the temple in manhattan instead so really it was more like it was relocated from white plains which is hmm. really north of the um of the New York City metropolitan Yeah, it's one of the last area. stop. It's one of the last stops if you exit out of uh, Grand Central Station. Station you head towards White Plains, so um, it's kind of a commuter town. That's interesting. Okay, we got a hard out coming up here. We're already actually, well, dude. There's uh, we got to be done in the next five minutes here, or else Brittany is gonna. Um, we well, she's gonna be angry at me. I was just gonna say, there's actually one temple that Matt definitely did not know. What that was deconstructed. What by. Yeah, people came in and actually tore it down. The Temple of Herod, Matt. Oh, yeah. that. <laughs> so that. Another example I'll give real quick is in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, the church actually had a groundbreaking ceremony, broke ground, started excavation, and it was built. It was going to be built next to um, a large Catholic basilica, and there was such significant community opposition, and the church agreed and said, you know, we don't want it to seem like we're making our temple better than, than the Catholics Basilica. So they actually moved the location and they used a different plot of ground for the temple. There. See, the church doesn't want to fight with people. Church wants to get along. Dude, what's hilarious is Chris Murphy just said, why is the church building all these temples? 
<laughs> I'm like, I love Chris. Chris needs an honorary membership. Uh, Chris, I-, I don't know if you've been listening for the past one hour and 51 <laughs> minutes, but that-, that has indeed been the subject of Matt Martinick's entire diatribe here. The myriad reasons why the church is building them. So you, you can keep asking why, bro, Seth. But, um, you know, hey, that's, uh, that's why we're here talking about it. Also, you guys heard it. You heard it here. Okay. The top 10 list. Also, I got savaged in the chat it. by Paulie Nike's 2000. But, you know, he's a member, so he can savage me. That's Says, true. is Cardin more boomer level cringeworthy than normal this evening? What? <laughs> the kids in Problem Solver Politics called me Cardin the Boomer King. It was really funny. Really? Yeah, the internet munchkins called me Cardin the Boomer King. So I wear it as a badge of honor, and I represent all my friends of the boomer generation with love and compassion. You know? <laughs> I say that's hilarious. Cardin's a total boomer. Polly Nikes. But you know what? You know what? He pays. He pays. So I'll take I'll He's take a member. That's right. Yeah. So, so okay. those are the predictions, guys. This weekend, you're going to hear whether or not Matt was correct, and if he's wrong. So do we want to talk me. three minutes? Oh, I can guarantee you that there'll be temples on that top 10 list that are not announced. So Okay. So I'm going to okay. prepare you for the disappointment. But we yeah. all know there's going to be a Utah one and a Brazil one because it ain't conference without one of those places being said. <laughs> wow. Actually, the two conferences, we haven't had a Utah temple announced. Okay, so okay. we've got we've got a um, we've got another super chat here, and then one minute on modular construction. We might have to do this on the next live stream, and we're gonna have to invite Matt back <clears> for another live stream. He's a genius in chief here. Uh, Brittany, read the last super chat that just came out. Keepers of the okay. chat. Okay, and then I'm going to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Brian Bacon, question on Kirtland stems from Church of Christ. I'm assuming stating publicly they are out of money again and considering liquidating assets. Great show. That's what I heard. Well, okay. Oh, for community of Christ, you mean? Yeah, the community, community of Christ. Christ. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to auction, guys. Come on, Ward Radio. Let's put together some money. Let's head out hey, there. I got auction. Let's get this. And, if, and my thought is, is that if the church were to acquire the Kirtland Temple, I don't think they would, would remodel it and make it into a temple like we use today, just because that temple was never built to be intended mm-hmm. to be used that way. So I don't think that would happen. That also, at this point, it's too historic. Like, you... It, they would build a functional temple next door in, you know, in some one acre. It'd be lot. like Manti and Ephraim, same type of thing, where in Manti, yeah. they're like, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to tear down these, these murals that are so significant and, and important. We're going to, we're just going to make another temple that's just, you know, five, two miles away. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, awesome. And then last, uh, this will be our outro. Uh, remember, guys, if you haven't had a chance yet to like the stream, like the stream in the last two or three minutes here. Um, if you have any final burning questions that you got from Matt Martinick here, uh, make sure that you send them to us in a super chat. We'll do our best to read them on air if they are germane, germane and they are appropriate. And what is the deal, Jonah, with modular construction? Why are people freaking about out about modular construction? My modular man? construction. We we talked about this just just for its just for a second uh, in this own stream here. But Cardin was spot on. Actually, the modular construction of the temples is to make temple construction faster. Quote from Bishop uh, Waddell: We can't take five or ten years to build a, a temple now and keep up with President Nelson. We must find ways to be more productive, to use sacred resources more effectively, to perhaps change the way we do things in some ways. So the church now is contracting a company in Alabama, in Alabama, okay. who's making modular temper, temples. There, uh, it's a company called Blocks in Bessemer, Bessemer, Alabama, and they build pieces of the temple and have it ready to go um, so that when the church announces a new temple, they can just ship it right out there and have it and have it uh, constructed in far less time. So they'll take the basics of a temple, the basics of a layout of a temple, the rooms that are all kind of similar, and they'll and they'll prefab them, so to speak, and then ship them right out so that the construction is chopped way, way down. So that's the new modular temples. That's because we are building temples so fast <laughs> that we can't, can't keep up with them. So yeah, so they put it on a truck, and they ship it out there, and it reduces the construction time and... Uh, yeah. So Matt, any opinions on like? So I'm gonna I'm gonna make a major blow into that explanation because that's not oh, true. Geez. <laughs> oh jeez. Oh my family's <laughs> watching that. Oh man. So the, for example, the temple that had the shortest duration from ground. He let you go to the end. He let <laughs> you go <laughs> to the <laughs> end just to take a just to take a big like, fat hours ago, but <laughs> just to take a big fat statistical dump. On your theory. Hey, man, I was quoting Bishop Waddell. Come on. So, so 
But let me explain. So the shortest duration we ever had in church history from when a temple was with the groundbreaking to when it was dedicated was eight months and nine days. And that was in 1997. Wow, that's fast. And that was the Monticello, Utah temple. So, and then you're thinking, well, I'm sure Helena, which was the first Major temple, I'm sure that's going to be, you know, one, two or three or something. Helena is number 60. If you rank all the temples from shortest amount of time from groundbreaking to dedication to, um, you know, you know, in terms of the shortest time, it's 60th in that list. And so, and some of these, I mean, most of these temples that were built this quickly, they were built in the late 90s. So Anchorage, Alaska was eight months, 22 days. Reno, Nevada, eight months, 30 days. I don't have this memorized. I'm looking at a spreadsheet. So don't be like, holy crap. How does he know that? Because I don't know that. Okay. I looked it up and found out. So, and this is on the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ temples.org. Rick Satterfield is a friend of mine. I've known him for decades. Fantastic guy. We have a great time together with stuff. We actually once did a, actually I'll go into that. Cause it'll take so, so you're time. saying that it's not for sp- for speed? I think it is for speed to a certain extent, because, I mean, if you look at the duration for the uh, Helena, Montana temple, it was one year and 11 months. So from, from groundbreaking dedication. So, I mean, that's, that's a little less than two years. If we were to look at like the median, you know, or mean for that, it's going to be probably more like around three years. So it might save a year. Also, that's the first one they've done, so it might have taken longer, perhaps, to do it because mm. it's the first one to be done. So I think that is a possibility, um, but by no means is it the fastest. It's 60th, like I said in the list. So, but in terms of why the modular construction is happening, I, I think there's several reasons for it. I do think it probably saves on cost. Um, also, one of the challenges the church has with temples is maintaining good. Uh, quality of construction. And so there's been examples of temples where they've built part of it and they've had to do demolition work and take out a bunch of what was built because it was done so poorly. So that's happened with like the Rome Italy temple. That's one of the reasons why it took so long to build. Also the Abidjan Ivory Coast temple had that same thing happen. It's still under construction, even though it's been like that for like five years. So, so that's a challenge, um, especially outside the United States. Inside the United States, that's not as much of an issue. So I think it might be more of a cost issue. It might speed up more when they start doing it, you know, know, when it becomes more of a common thing that's done. But so far, it hasn't been significantly different than those late 90s temples. But a lot of those late 90s temples, they've had to remodel them. So I wonder if it might have been because of some construction issues because they were built so quickly. Well, and we're building building four, ten times the number of temples now, right? So, yeah. I mean, that would go along with what what Bishop Waddell was saying, is that at the, the rate that we're accelerating, let's try this new modular temple, and maybe Helena wasn't the fastest, but maybe it's a new system they're starting up. So I could still be kind of half-ish right, Matt. <laughs> That's funny. Be. I think we'll just have to see when we have more of them done, but, I mean, from the progress I've seen on others, I don't know if it's going to be... I might take off a year, which is still, you know, an improvement, but... Uh, it might, it's not like, you know, what we saw with some of these other temples where it was less than a year from, from start to finish. That's yeah, right. I think, I think I, I think All right, I guys. this one. Okay. I think Matt's jealous. I nailed that one. So unfortunately we are literally like an hour into overtime here, uh, <laughs> but it's because we had, we had Matt Martinick with us. Uh, literally any last super chats, get them out right now. Cause I'm doing my outro, baby. I'm doing my outro. So we'll have anyway. Matt back in the future. Cause he is. He has proven his he has proven his worth, his yes, mind. Yes, he has proven to be a walking encyclopedia of all kinds of cool knowledge. And we're gonna have to talk to him a little bit more. Um, anyway, uh, thanks a million guys. If you haven't had a chance yet, please follow us on all the platforms, okay? Um, if we ever need to get the word out about an upcoming live stream, about an upcoming article or opinions on things and we can't make a video or something like that, sometimes we'll communicate on Twitter. So you can just check us out at Ward Radio. Uh, Jonah, it's Ward Radio Show on Twitter, correct? On Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on, we're, we're, we're on Facebook, yeah. On Facebook, it's at no. On Facebook, it's at World Radio Worldwide, I believe. And on Twitter, I believe it's at World Radio Show. We'll figure it out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but check You're us right. out. On World Radio Worldwide on Facebook. World Award Radio Show on Twitter. On TikTok. LDSChurchGrowth.blogspot.com for yes. Matt. 
and I was going to uh, put that up on the screen. Um, I was going to say thank you to Matt. Matt, how can people find you if they want to find you? Uh, do you have any socials you want to throw out? Do you have? I just want to uh, send people to your blog. What do you want people to do? Uh, I'm putting yeah, it up. Yeah, I on think you know what people usually do is they just comment on my blog. So I'm currently pretty heavily moderating comments on the blog just because I've had some people that are not acting like adults. <laughs> There. Oh, that, that's so funny. I'm, I'm having to moderate that just because it becomes abusive and totally off topic. But anyway, but yeah, so it might take a few hours or even half a day or a day to, to prove that because I have other things I do with my life besides doing that. Um, but yeah, that might be the easiest way is just go onto that, my blog and have it. If you have a comment or a question, post it on there. Um, be probably the easiest way to get in touch with me. Okay, Matt, cool. you've been an excellent guest. Thank you so much for bringing your expertise to the channel. Thanks a lot. Yeah, dude, dude you're awesome. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. No sweat. That's awesome. So anyway, it has been real and it has been fun and it has been real fun. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. As always, uh, you know, if you haven't liked yet, like. If you haven't shared yet, share it. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. It's been real and it's been